solution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gavriel Hakoen. Last night, my BFF and co-host, uh, cult expert, cult survivor, Sadie Carpenter, and I, we sat down for almost four hours and talked about Jill Duggar Dillard's new book, Counting the Cost. This is the second book release from a Duggar family member this year with Jill's book following her sister Ginger Duggar Vuolo's release of Becoming Free Indeed that came out early this year. These books could not be more different. If any of you remember from our episode about Ginger's book that we came out um, this winter, this spring, we were not all that positive on that book. We found it to be a bit reductive. We found her pitch to fundamentalism survivors that they should abandon their deconstruction in favor of what she calls disentanglement. We found that proposition almost insulting and there was no real new information about the family. There were no bombshells. There, there was nothing really. As we learned from Jill's book, however, the lack of new information from Ginger's book was likely due to Ginger's signing of a lifetime non-disclosure agreement for an $80,000 payout from her father, Jim Bob Duggar. Jill, however, did not sign a non-disclosure agreement, and as a result, counting the cost, like, we get it all. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Counting the Cost is a book about Jill's changing relationship with her father and his exploitation of his own family, his young daughters especially, in exchange for money, for power, and for status within Bill Gothard's cult, the Institute for Basic Life Principles. There were passages of Counting the Cost that were deeply painful to hear. There were passages in which Jill told a different story than we had been previously inclined to believe. I listened to the audiobook on a red eye from Portland to Newark, and I could not stop. I had to keep asking the flight attendants for coffee. I stayed up for two days straight listening and, and taking notes on this book, and I hope that you guys like what we've got to say about it. But before we get into that, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast that is mostly about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We have episodes relating to the Duggars, the IBLP, and Bill Gothard. If you're a big nerd like us and you want to get into the nitty gritty details of how fundamentalism works on the ground level, we have episodes about specific passages in scripture that the fundies use to justify their doctrines of things like women wearing long skirts instead of pants, you know, not dancing, never drinking alcohol. They all have a supposed biblical justification. We have episodes about all of those and how they twist and 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 do those Bible verses. So if you want to listen to that, we've got that too. We have episodes about cults like the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, Jim Jones in Jonestown. And we have an episode that just came out a couple weeks ago about Brittany Don Nelson, the notorious Christian fitness influencer and scammer. Um, and we put weeks of research into that one. We're really proud of that one. So if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, we hope that you will choose to support our Patreon. We have been working around the clock to bring you this episode. The book came out on September 12th, and we wrapped recording at about 2 a.m. on the 14th to get it out to you guys as quickly as possible, and we wouldn't be able to put this much work into making our show without the incredible Patreon support that we get. And if you want, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash leavingedenpodcast. The Patreon version of our episodes, including today's episode, is extended, uncensored, ad-free, and you get it a couple days early. So if you want to hear the extended version of today's episode and our extended analysis of Counting the Cost by Jill Duggar Dillard, then you can find that on patreon.com slash leaving Eaton podcast. We also like to thank everybody who recommends this show to their friends, their family, their coworkers, um, their enemies. Uh, that's the number one way we grow audience, and that's the number one way that we get new listeners, and that's why our podcast is on the path it's on to be a real sustainable effort for us. 
If you want to join our Facebook group and talk with other fans of the show and other you know people in the Fundy Snark community, we have a Facebook group called Eden Exodus. You can go and find it on facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. We also have a subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Without further ado, we just have to thank the patrons and then we'll get into the episode itself. We have three I gave it all tier patrons. Your names are Kathleen Moncrief. Melissa Mosley, and Todd Dale on behalf of his lovely deconstruct arena of a wife, Madeline Antrim. Thank you guys so much. We would not be able to make this show without your guys' incredible support, as well as the support of our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. Your names are Alex P., Ali Allen, Anisha Patel, Autumn of Our Discontent, Brittany, Brooke Tully, Krissa, Crystal Patterson, Dear Ethan Hansen, the musical, Dora J, Eleanor Donahue, Enchanted Fairy, Esther M, Hannah Ross, Hope Norum, Horton Hears a Shane, Janine Collin, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jana, K. Terwee, Kristen Marie, Learned Vixen, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Lorena Watson, Madeline Antrim, Marlena Stuve, Marsha Millard, Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arendt, Rob the Methodist, Stephanie Johnson, Steve and Amy, Susie, Tara McNamara, 1010, and Wes the Cowboy. Thank you guys so much, and thank you as well to all of our wonderful patrons and everybody who just supports the show in other ways, like I said before, like recommending it. Thank you guys so much. You guys are fantastic. All right, Sadie, do you want to hit us with that TW? Sure thing. In general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we'll mention at least a few of these topics, but we do try to avoid any graphic detail unless it's relevant to the story that we're telling. And if we are going to include anything that we feel is graphic or potentially extra triggering, we will give the audience a heads up before we get into it. This episode contains discussion of child sexual assault and child sexual assault materials. Um, We will not be going into, it's been our policy never to go into detail on those things. And doubly so here because Jill has made it very clear in her book that she would not like anyone to go into detail or speculate about the details of her particular assault. So we will be steering far away from that. Um, We will also be talking about different um, things like child labor and guilt, fear, and shame through religion. Of course, we'll be talking about Bill Gothard, although we won't be going into detail on his assaults of teenage girls and young women either. I think that's that about covers it for this episode. And I, I will warn you, this book was brutal. This was so, so tough. There were a couple moments where I had to check out, I where I had to... Also, this should be obligatory, but blanket spoiler warning for everything that happens in this book, counting the cost. Um, If you haven't read it yet and you don't want the bombshell spoiled, it's going to be in there. And I will say, I think in when we talked about Ginger's book, it was from the perspective of we, we read this so you don't have to. I am glad that this is not that. With talking about Jill's book, it's we read this, but I think you should also. In Ginger's book, it was mostly about her religious journey, and she didn't really have that much new drama or new information to spill. Like, even about her brother Josh, she didn't really have that much negative stuff to say, except for the sort of like, oh, if you read between the lines, there's maybe the implication of this thing that she's saying here, that there's a possibility that he isn't saved, which in fundy terms, saying that somebody isn't saved, that's a big deal. But to the rest of us, like... Yeah, like that. Sure, we like we get it. The like he's in jail for child sexual abuse materials possession. Like, but even like the IBLP kind of got off easy in that book. Like she refrained from calling them a cult, and I personally believe that it that might have something to do with the NDA that she 
may or may not have signed toward the towards the end of Jill's book that Jill reveals that Jill never signed but was offered to all of the Duggar children in exchange for eighty thousand dollars, and that might be responsible for her maybe not wanting to yep um disparage the group that jim bob is working on behalf oh of i don't even know do you want to do you want to kind of start just going through the book because there there is a lot yeah why don't we start with like a general overview okay does that sound good sure yeah do you, you go ahead oh okay i'll go first okay i can tell the immense love that she feels for her parents despite all of the extreme rules she doesn't describe being emotionally neglected as a child she doesn't describe the the fear that she describes is the fear that if she steps outside from under her parents protection that she, she won't have that level of protection which is in line with what we've heard from ex iblp people who have written into us but she doesn't describe parents who are absent or parents who are neglectful she describes mm-hmm. Yeah, she describes true desire that her parents would love her the same way that she loves them. And the real hurt in this book is that her parents' love for her was conditional. Their love was metered out systematically and mathematically to ensure maximum obedience. No matter what she did, she could never be good enough. And no matter what other siblings, namely Josh, did, they could never do anything wrong. The evidence of this, I think we all saw in the excerpt that came out of the book that that came out before it was released, in which Jill is having a mediated discussion. Jill and Derek are having a mediated discussion with Jim, Bob, and Michelle, and this is late in the book. Um, And Jill says to Jim, Bob, Jim, Bob is is shaming her and guilting her for wearing pants and having a nose ring. Mm -hmm. And, And Jill's response to this is... Basically, I just want you to love me and you treat me worse than my pedophile brother. And that was the quote that got blown up. But I think that quote really strikes to the heart of the story that Jill is telling in this book. The reason that this book was so hard for me to read was that Ginger's, it was very different from Ginger's narrative that she put in her book, um, Becoming Free Indeed which we reviewed at the very beginning of this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Ginger's whole narrative was I always had questions and I always knew that there was something not quite right about the IBLP and fundamentalist things that I was being taught. I always had these questions and doubts and thank goodness Jeremy came along to (laughs) educate me on true Christianity. And Jill's narrative is incredibly different. Jill's narrative is, I was the good girl. I was the church girl. I did everything to belong. I did everything to follow the rules. All I ever wanted was to be perfect and to do it right. I was bought in and sold out. And the system still chewed me up and spit me out and literally, in Jill's case, almost killed her. And that is so much more my story than the narrative that Ginger is telling us. Jill's story is so much more personal to me because that's way more similar to my story. And I think that's one reason why this was so difficult to read. And just thinking about like comparison to your story and uh, parallels to your story, Jill got married in 2014 to Derek, who was not a member of the IBLP. That was also 2014 was the same year that Recovering Grace happened, that all of those dozens and dozens of women came in with allegations against Bill Gothard and the IBLP. And that scandal became part of the catalyst that ended up getting Jill out of the IBLP. Mm-hmm. Whereas she didn't necessarily think of her marriage to Derek, who was not IBLP, as the same sort of like pathway out of the IBLP that maybe Ginger saw her marriage to Jeremy. And I thought that that was kind of similar to how you were basically the one that did everything right. And it was the SCOP scandal that we uh, talked about in our five-part series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, back in 2020. It was that really bombshell of a scandal and his uh, arrest and his conviction and his prison sentence that was the thing that ended up getting you on your way out of fundamentalism in a very real way. Yeah, that was where it went... I think previous to the SCOP scandal, it was more 
oh, maybe the IFB will change from the inside out and will become more compassionate and will become less misogynist and the, you know, the things that I was concerned about and worried about at the time. And when the SCOP scandal came out, that was what was, no, this group is not going to change. I am going to need to leave. Jill is a lot more similar to me personality-wise than I anticipated. Yeah. How did it feel reading that book then? Hard, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had a hard time with some of the parts of that book, and I wasn't even raised in fundamentalism, so I can't imagine how it must have been for you. There was a whole, um, I don't know if listeners may hear me, like, um, unlocking and locking my phone throughout this episode. I have the book on my phone on Kindle, and I have just a slew of highlights that I want to read. Um, because, and I just went through and, and highlighted things that sounded like me. One of them, and this is from the very end of the book, and I'm sure we'll come back around to it, but one of them, the things that she said was, I had always struggled in that area. I grew up believing subconsciously that wherever, whenever there was any bad feeling, it was up to me to do what I could to fix it. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. <laughs> And that is a sentiment that we have heard countless times from listeners, like especially femme people, listeners who have, who have sent messages to the show. Yeah, especially those of us who were oldest or older children in a large family. Yeah. So let's get into the narrative of this book. I thought that it was interesting to read this book coming from Jill, especially because she is one of the older members of the family. So she has really clear memories of what their life was like before they were getting TV specials and before they were on TLC and Discovery. But she's describing these days back when her father was a state senator and he was running for U.S. Senate. And she, mm -hmm. yeah, she describes going around, putting up campaign signs and how Jim Bob believes that God told him that he should run for U.S. Senate and that it's calling to do that. And she describes going around and helping him with his campaign. And honestly, this sounds like a, she describes it as a very fond memory that she has with her father. Yeah, and I think this is kind of a key to understanding the story that Jill is telling us. Bef she feels that the TV show itself and the fame and the money that came with it were a major part of what fractured her relationship with her parents. Jill describes going to an IBLP conference in Tennessee when she is a child. She's like 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, sometime around that age. By this time, the Duggar family already has about a dozen kids or maybe a few more. And on stage at this IBLP conference, Bill Gothard pulls these families who have auditioned to be what he calls model families, and they look perfect. Their kids are well-behaved. They're very cookie cutter. And he's saying, this model family is a perfect family. They, they've done everything by the rules. They've done everything that they were supposed to do. And they are truly living our doctrine that children are a blessing, because that is the number one thing in this group, is that your children are a blessing. That's why they call themselves quiver the Duggars had all these kids, but they were not as clean. They were not as cookie cutter. They were not as well behaved as these model families. But once they started getting TV specials off of being IBL, once they started getting notoriety in the secular world and around the world by basically going on television and espousing these beliefs that children are a blessing, our children are a blessing, our children are a blessing, that was the thing that allowed the Duggars and Jim Bob and Michelle to become the IBLP superstars that they turned into. And because they were famous and because they were making all of this money off of saying we are IBLP, this is how we live. The IBLP, Bill Gothard basically said, well, it's okay that your children aren't as perfect. Maybe they're a little bit more rowdy than all of these other model families. You can still be a model family. You can still be the one that we hoist up and that we show off because you guys are the ones who are showing to the world and you guys are the ones who are famous and successful off of this yeah jill barely references this in her book but i think one thing a lot of snarkers would be familiar with is the concept of dugger time um <laughs> a lot of us have read uh stories from 
wait staff at restaurants who have waited on the Duggar family or other people in service industry who have interacted with them and will tell us that they are just always late. Um, the whole family stays up super late at night and, and sleeps in in the morning because that's just the only way they can get by with that many <laughs> children. And they're always at least 20 minutes, 20 minutes late to anything that they go to. Um, and this is, this is the kind of thing that would have disqualified them from being a model family for the IBLP had they not gotten reality TV fame and fortune. Jim Bob's identity is so heavily tied in with him being this godly patriarch who espouses these IBLP teachings and has been rewarded for it. And he has families coming up to him asking him, how do I be just like you? How do I make my family just like yours? And the reason why he can do that is because he has this TV show and he is using his family to make content that is promoting the IBLP lifestyle to outsiders and to the secular world, not just the Christian world, the secular world as well. And if he loses that level of control over his family, he loses his status, he loses his power, he loses his influence over everything. Mm -hmm. It's it's really interesting. And Jill does not analyze this, which I, I don't blame her for. I wouldn't um, want to psychoanalyze my family that way either. But she, she hints consistently throughout the book that this is a story about Jim Bob's corruption, gradual corruption over time. Because she talks about her parents in ways that we didn't really expect. One thing that really stood out to me very early in the book is Jill talks about how good of a mother Michelle was. And there's this idea in the snark community from things that, that comes directly from things that we've heard from the Duggar family. So it's not um, unfounded that Michelle really only mothered children for about six months. And then when they were no longer nursing, she would pass them off to the next girl who was due to get a buddy under the buddy system. And then that child would be expected to feed, clothe, bathe that baby and raise it the rest of the way. And that's not, um, this book doesn't completely destroy that idea. This book does talk about the buddy system and how that worked in practicality everyday life. But one thing that Joel tells us that differs from this narrative of Michelle as a disengaged and uninvolved mother is that when children in the house were sick, even if Michelle was sick herself, she would be up all night just going from room to room taking care of each sick kid and how tenderly she took care of her children when they were sick. And I think because we recognize the buddy system as inappropriate as parentification, which is a form of abuse, it's easy for us to assume that that abuse of parentification was still going on. Even if a, a girl in the buddy system were sick, she would still be caring for her younger siblings who were her buddies. And um, Jill says that's not true. Michelle was a a loving and involved mother and especially was very tender with her children when they were sick. I did find Jill's portrayal of her mother very interesting. I think that in the snarker verse, we tend to be a bit hard on Michelle for various reasons. Um, I think she gets what she deserves. <laughs> that's fair. Um, Michelle is almost always portrayed not in Jill's book, but in, in the Snarker versus somebody who is very meek, somebody who doesn't speak out very much or doesn't. Um, yeah. And and again, I, we're not faulting Snarkers for thinking that because that is what Michelle shows us. It is what she shows us. But the there's this one section in the book. This is after when basically the family is in crisis mode because the in touch has published the police reports the, and the story about Josh's molestation of his sisters. And the entire family is in crisis and they are in this campground in Oklahoma and they are kind of hunkered down all together and trying to figure out what to do next. Josh 
says some like sort of almost like a flippant comment about this story leaking it was basically like ah oh, not this again i thought we already dealt with this was kind of the nature of the comment that he made sort of like i thought this was in the past this again like this is stupid michelle responds to josh and says uh, and this is the quote here it's not your fault that this was released but you need to know that you were behind all this stop being so arrogant yeah sorry i'm looking something up yeah that is something that really stood out to a couple people that i've talked to that in that moment michelle was very ready to jump in and no i don't think so you this is your fault there are a couple different moments in this book there are a lot of descriptions of michelle behaving in a very predictable michelle duggar way there is a whole section where she talks about dancing and how the Duggar children were allowed to jump for joy, but never dance. And Michelle would get on to them if she saw any butts shaking while the children were jumping for joy. My favorite detail of this section was that if people started getting too hyped, she would put on Handel's water music. And there are there are a lot of times that she really behaves like you would expect Michelle Duggar. Like, yeah, that's a Michelle Duggar way to behave. Um, but there are two places that stuck out to me. So the first one is when Michelle comes down hard on Josh um, in that camp in Oklahoma saying, stop being arrogant. This is, you did this. And then there's another one that I'm sure we'll talk about towards the end of the episode where Michelle uh, shows up at Jill and Derek's house in the middle of the night to bring them some paperwork that they have been trying to get Jim Bob to give them for years. And he kept running them around, refused to give it to them, causing them all kind of trouble. And Michelle mysteriously and without warning shows up there at their house at like 12, 15 in the morning to deliver it to them. I think that this was very, because we're going to talk about this later, but I think that this is another example of whenever things get contentious or whenever things get difficult it falls to the responsibility of women and, and femme people to smooth things over and make sure everything's happy and, and try to like appease people and um get rid of any conflict the dancing thing that because they attended a baptist church and they went to a christmas celebration in which there was dancing and it, it was it was like shocking to them to watch and this ended up being the catalyst for Jim Bob taking his family out of that church and starting his own home church with only other IBLP families. Um, so it's him taking control again, but also it, it's just another example of the restrictiveness of yes the rules. Yeah. But Jill also says that she doesn't, she did not as a child find the rules of her household to be a burden. She described them more as comforting like and and that makes so much sense to me with like my personality type i as a child i thrived under the ifb rules because i it was clear expectations clear rules and skirts have to be this many inches below your knee great i can measure i can do that <laughs> And I, I think certain personality types that can like having those clear expectations can really feel comforting before you grow up and realize how restrictive that is to you as a kid. Jill describes this black and white world that she lives in where everything is either godly or worldly. And if you want to be godly, it's good to have that mm -hmm. XYZ set of rules that you have to follow because you know when you're in bounds. Yes. And I think it it can turn into adults who have an overdependence on rules or checklists. Like I am the kind of person I make a checklist every day and I put on my checklist, like take my allergy medicine and wash my face and put on sunscreen and get dressed and get the baby up and feed the baby breakfast. And all of those things are things that I would do whether they were on a checklist or not. But I find as an adult, I need the the sense of accomplishment of I got the checklist and I need a completed checklist to make me feel like I got everything done, like to deal with my anxiety. And I think that may be a function of being raised in fundamentalism. 
I think it is so important that you pointed out that Jill is a person who did well under the legalism and who was almost happy to have it and happy to live under that system. And we see this a lot with people that we talk to is that the legalism works and the legalism works and the legalism works until it doesn't. And for somebody like Jill, that's sort of like because it works for her, she doesn't see that it is a system that is also used to oppress people and that the laws can be used to oppress her whether or not she thinks that she's following the rules or not. And the fact that she buys in and the fact that she believes it doesn't actually protect her from being punished by that system and that she follows all of the rules and yet she still gets treated like she's a criminal. Therefore, the rules are just a tool of whoever is in charge of interpreting those rules to keep people under their control. And I want to bring up an example of this, and I'm sure that we're going to talk about multiple times in this discussion. There is a man who is visiting the Duggars house after the Duggars have a TV show. And Jim Bob is trying to get this man to come on the TV show. And this man, basically, he doesn't really want to. And he says that he would rather minister to people one-on-one because he feels like that's more true to what he thinks Jesus would do than to go on television and try to minister to people over television. Jim Bob says that it's basically this man's responsibility to minister to as many people as possible, and because he has this giant megaphone of a TV program, he should do it there. This man kind of pushes back on him, and this is where you see Jim Bob basically go extremely out of pocket with the attitude that the interpretation is basically whatever I want it to be. And Jim Bob makes an analogy of if you had a whole stadium full of people who were ready to listen to you give the gospel, you would have to get up and speak to that whole stadium. It's kind of your only choice. This guy says, well, what if there is one guy standing by himself under the bleachers and I feel like God is calling me to go talk to that one guy? You can have the punchline. Go ahead. Tell us what Jim Bob said. Jim Bob says, God would never tell you to do that. God would never tell you to do that. And this moment comes early in the book, and I think this is probably one of the first times in this book that we sort of see flashes of this side of Jim Bob. It comes out a lot later, and later in uh, her dealings with Jim Bob as she's older, as she's an adult— We see this much, 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 much more, and this becomes the primary way that we see Jim Bob. But like one thing I actually do want to give Jill credit for is that she does a very good job of showing not just how Jim Bob changes over time, but how as she grows up, the way that she sees him changes. Because at the start of the book, the main way that he is portrayed is he is a fun, he is a loving guy, he is a a, a man who loves the rules and loves his faith, but he also loves his family very much. And as we get later and later and later in the book, it becomes much more about power and much more about control. And a lot of this does center around uh, her assault as a child by a convicted felon, Josh Duggar, um, and and her parents' reaction to it, and then the fallout roughly 10 years later, and her parents' reaction to that. Because prior to both the TV show and Josh's assaults on his sisters, so before either one of those things really happened, she describes her parents as as fun, as very engaged. And I do think it's clear that the Duggar children did not receive the education that they deserved. Of course, that's clear to everyone, especially those of us who are familiar with both the Wisdom Booklets curriculum and the ACE curriculum, which are the two that Michelle used to homeschool her children. However, there were things that their parents did right as far as education, um, like taking John Bob would take some of the children to work with him. And I don't I, I don't really have a problem with that as an extracurricular homeschool type activity because the kids clearly learned practical life skills and social skills and people skills and probably a little bit of math in there too, if he was taking them to work as a tow truck driver or as a used car salesman. 
what I take issue with is that that wasn't combined with more traditional formal education that they that children also deserve flat out period. Another great example of this is when Jim Bob was state senator and he was taking his kids to work with him at the yeah, yeah at the Capitol. Great way to learn civics is to to do that. Yeah. Um, I think the taking them to work at the Capitol part is fantastic. The not having a sufficient curriculum is the problem here. But prior to the show and prior to uh, Josh's assaults on his sisters, it was almost she almost describes her childhood as idyllic and her parents just as loving and engaged. And that foundation is shaken when her parents call her in to ask about what happened with Josh. And then that foundation starts to crack and crumble when the TV series begins. So one of the things I think we absolutely have to talk about is, and it comes up over and over, is Jim Bob telling his children, do not stir up contention among the brethren. This is a saying that Jim Bob says over and over again. That's one of his sayings, and I'm sure it's in scripture. I can probably just look it up real quick. Hold on. I should have Googled this before, but I'll do it now. When she brings this up, she brings it up in the context that they were being told this to basically say, don't be a tattletale. Don't tell on your siblings when they're doing something wrong. But later in the book, as business dealings get a bit more shady, it becomes a way to say, Don't talk to your siblings about what the contract that you're being asked to sign says in it. Don't talk to them about whether they plan to sign it, whether or not they think it's fair, whether they have any addendums that they'd like to add, anything that they'd like to change. Don't talk about it at all. Stirring up contention goes from don't cause trouble to don't cause conflict, even if that's conflict that needs to happen Mm -hmm. because people are being treated unfairly. It's very similar in my mind to like when dictators preach pacifism. Right. So I found the actual verse um, in King James. It's Proverbs 6, 18 through 19. And I'm very familiar with this passage. Um, This is a passage. This is the passage. um, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth with wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. This, so this is from, from Proverbs, and I think the, the scriptural intent would be, don't just go stirring up trouble. Like, don't, don't be a troll on Twitter. <laughs> don't, don't just, <laughs> sorry, Gabby. <laughs> yeah. I think the the intent is pretty clear, but this is actually a biblical literal, literalism problem because the word brethren leads Jim Bob to believe that it means literally brothers. He is he's taking it more literally than the text clearly intends. Then he starts to use this phrase as a tool of control. And it's really interesting because when the Duggar kids are little, it does seem like Jim Bob is using this more in a scriptural sense. Like, don't antagonize your siblings. Don't be a tattletale. Don't unnecessarily cause conflict. But the further this story goes on, like as you just mentioned, the more Jim Bob is using this as a tool of control and as a tool of guilt to wield his power over his now adult children. This is something that we see commonly with very legalistic cultures, very legalistic systems such as the IBLP. Because for somebody like you, you would understand what this passage of scripture means. You would understand that this passage is, don't go causing trouble, and you're also a person who likes the rules. Yeah, and dislikes conflict. Absolutely. And... So if you see the rules as a place of refuge, if you have your checklist to say, okay, I'm not doing X, Y, Z thing. I'm perfectly fine. I have nothing to worry about. But if you're a person who is the kind of person that is inclined to abuse rules, then you would see a very legalistic system as an opportunity for you to bend other people to your will that you see rules as something that only exists in order for you to get other people under your power. 
and all these rules are just a game and you happen to be the best at it. And so you deserve to be in charge of everybody because you're the best. And the rules are simply a tool for you to remain in control of everybody else and everybody else's lives. And that's just the way that it's meant to be. And that's what I see in Jim Bob here. Yeah. And I think like for me, hang on, I'm looking up another scripture reference. I may should have put a trigger warning for King James version in this episode. But this made me think of a verse that I memorized as a kid, which is where is the King where's the King James? Uh, Romans 12:18, if it be possible as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. And that that was kind of what I wanted as a kid. It's using the rules to not ever be in trouble or be at conflict with anybody using the rules as a mechanism for avoiding conflict. And that's something I see in Jill when she talks about her early life. Do you think this is why she led with the story that she led with in the prologue? The the story where she is on a sled with Derek in 2014, slightly before they are married and they're sledding together outside the Duggar house and they're just having a good time. And Michelle comes out and, and says a new rule to them that they weren't aware of that boys and girls aren't allowed on the same sled. And she yells it across the yard to them. And they're like a bit, mm-hmm. she's caught off guard Yeah, because her, her mother is suddenly instituting a new rule that she didn't previously know about when she thought she had gone to every extent to follow every rule. And she, Oh my goodness. Um, the way she describes Michelle's expressions and voice in this passage, I wanted to read that. She was smiling that same smile the world has seen for years, a smile that's pure innocence but protects like a shield, and her voice was full of sweetness and joy. Oof. She, wow. Yeah. <laughs> she nailed Michelle with that one. She really did. She. But mm. yeah, I think, I think maybe Jill kind of saw the rules the same way that I did. It's a, it's a way to avoid conflict and a way to feel assured about yourself. And something I, I want to get into talking about when the, the TV crews started to show up, because this is when Jill starts to express her childhood and teenage anxiety. And her anxiety is a major theme throughout the rest of this book. The documentaries started uh started happening i think the first one jill was 12 and something that caught my interest was tlc took them to the grocery store and asked them to do a grocery shop but tlc was going to pay for all the groceries so it was a very atypical shopping experience for them because they were buying all of this food that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to afford that was interesting because the way it's portrayed in those early TV specials is this is how we feed our family. And of course, now we know that's not accurate. And yes, I know that reality TV isn't real, but it's always interesting to find out about one of the ways that reality TV isn't real. This was really, um, this kind of hurt to find, not because like I'm disappointed to find out that reality TV isn't real because I know reality TV isn't real, but just in the way that I understand about IBLP is that Jim Bob Duggar is this patriarch in the IBLP, which means that he is a protector, but he is also a provider and TLC and this documentary became, this is how I provide for my family. So it's tied up into his identity, not just in the, Mm -hmm. I am the perfect IBLP man who follows the rules and I'm being blessed by blessed for it. But also this TV show is how I am the provider for my family, which is my role as the patriarch. Yeah. And I think that does inform Jim Bob's behavior towards the end of the book, because I think he saw himself as the person who brokered and ran the show. Therefore, he saw himself as the person who was providing for his family. And I don't think he was ever able to accept that his children were the workers on the show who were providing for the family because he needed to see himself as the patriarch, the provider, and all of that. And while 
this show did provide for his family in a financial means. There were other ways in which his children, because of this show, they were being deeply neglected. Mm -hmm. And like, like their privacy was being violated. In Jill's case, her personal safety and her like physical health, like she nearly died um, as a result of this. But furthermore, they never had the choice of whether or not they wanted their lives and their children's lives yes. to be wrapped up in this TV show. And even from the early days of there being a TV show, I wanted to read this quote from Jill. The presence of the film crew brought plenty of good things, but I quickly grew to dislike the way they sometimes wanted to spring surprises on us. I guess it made for good TV to see us react in real time to the news of whatever challenge or adventure they'd set up for us, even if it was just an escape room or a trip to a park. But it got to the point where I was feeling the stress nearly every time they were filming. Either I was trying to bury my discomfort and anxiety when they sprung a surprise on us, or fake my joy when we were filming something we'd already rehearsed. The pressure on Jill is ramping up and her feelings of anxiety are ramping up even from being a younger younger teenager. I'm thinking that the, like with this they almost invented you know that YouTube genre where it's ex, like it's reaction content but instead of being like kids react to this adults react to the old people react to it's big family reacts to escape room big family reacts to disneyland big family reacts i don't know like reacts to uh yes dolly Parton. yeah big family reacts to dolly but like it's like that it's that's that's a real that's a real episode they did yeah i remember or, or big family re reacts to miniature golf <laughs> marriage proposal Ew. but this is like legitimately i i do feel like the duggars and tlc together maybe invented this type of content where it's just like it like like the type of content that has been that has like evolved and morphed over the years into no the, like whatever the fuck youtube families is like you you see those families on like there's this one family that pretends to be really tall and they're like kind of tall but they're like we're all seven feet tall but they're not actually seven like i feel like the duggars like invented the, mm -hmm. like and TLC kind of invented, we're not going to lay it all at the Duggar's feet, but TLC kind of invented that kind of experiential content. And this is because it's all content where you're like almost vicariously living through other people on the internet that you also maybe possibly have a parasocial relationship with. It gets into very, very, very weird territory. And it's almost like I, I can see why people would watch the Duggars and get like obsessed with them and be like, I want to join the IBLP now because like they would get that parasocial relationship with the, the reality TV family that they watch on TLC. And I want to move on and talk about something that's kind of related to this. And it's the fact that they had to like rehearse their like big family moments, like courtship proposals, marriage proposals. They had to rehearse that for television before they could do it in real life yeah later on um it also comes out that she had to tell the television producers that she was pregnant before she could tell her family so that they could get the family reaction on video and that hurt that did hurt to read that was ugh. yeah like so there's this um like in in the reaction content YouTuber comparison, have you seen these videos that people will do where it's like a man will make a video where he'll be like, I tell my wife that she's pregnant. Yes. Have you seen these where like, it's like my wife pees in the middle of the night and doesn't flush. So I went in, I thought she'd been acting weird. So I dipped a pregnancy test in and they came out. But like, I'm like, that's not how that works. But they'll make these videos that are like impossible, but they'll get millions and millions and millions of views from like from people who are just like, oh, that's like they want to see that re like they want to see that emotion because that's like an emotion that they want to. It gets into very weird, like vicarious parasocial relationship. It's it's like the, the TLC and like the Duggars, they're like the originators of this. So I want to talk a little bit more about the pressures of the TV show because we're going to need to take up the offering here in a minute 
and I want to make sure that we set ourselves up for the for all of the things that unfold in the second half um, when it really gets wild. Jill already talked about the the pressure of just having the TV show to begin with, but then as as we all know, uh, there was a letter about Josh's abuse of his sisters and another young girl that was forgotten in a book. And that letter that was found was written by was written by Kaylee Holt, right? Kaylee Holt, I believe, is who it was. Jill doesn't say Kaylee Holt's name. She just says that it was a woman who Josh had been engaged to and that the engagement fell apart, that that she broke it off. But we know uh, from outside of that that it was Kaylee Holt. You saw her parents in the Shiny Happy People documentary. Jim Holt, uh, her father, was the one who was talking about how attractive he found his future wife when she was 14 years old and he was like 19. Yeah, and Jill actually does that a lot. There, She'll say, a sibling of mine said, or something like that. Um, there's another thing we're going to talk about later where she references the father of someone who was engaged at the time to one of my siblings. It's interesting that she does that when a lot of those people we can easily identify. And I, d- I haven't quite picked apart why she might have, she made the choices she did. Oh, I think I know why. Why? Because if she says somebody's name in the book and she names them by name, then they're more likely to appear in a tabloid headline and they're more likely for People Magazine to say, the letter that got the CPS called was written by Kaylee Holt and then Kaylee Holt, who's not like a public person, who's not like on TV, is now suddenly subjected to the possibility of being papped like Jill had been subjected to um, when, you know, and especially if it's like a woman, especially if it's like a, a, a femme person that is subjected to that. It, it can be incredibly invasive and incredibly abusive and traumatic. True. And, and she is going to talk about how she was re-traumatized when, the, when In Touch leaked all of the documents related to this CPS investigation. The book was loaned to somebody else, and then that person made a report, and then that report made its way to Oprah right before the Duggar family was supposed to be on Oprah, and that this ended up creating a CPS DHS investigation. While the the TV specials were going on, the girls who had been abused had to do interviews. There was a full investigation. There were child safety workers showing up at the house to make sure that things were the way they were supposed to be. And something that, so this is adding to the pressure on teenage Jill, seemingly from everywhere to not say the wrong thing and a fear that they would be taken away from their parents if they did say the wrong thing or even unintentionally say something that they shouldn't have. Um, I do want to talk about, I think I have a perspective on why this was so much pressure on her, because of course this would be an incredible amount of pressure on any young teenager, but among fundamentalists and more so among homeschool families, the fear and outright terror of CPS was a huge deal. And as I've made clear on this podcast, I technically legally went to school and the amount and severity that my parents hit me for discipline would surely, while I do not agree with that practice and don't practice it myself, the way my parents practiced physical discipline would surely not have been enough to have us taken away by CPS. There is no way. The worst that would have happened is a is a trip to family court and a don't hit your kids anymore. But my parents had been indoctrinated by groups like the HSLDA and David Gibbs to believe that they that their children could be taken away over this. So I was drilled and drilled and trained and trained to never tell anyone, especially a doctor who would be a mandatory mandatory reporter, that we were ever spanked. And I believed as a child that one wrong word to the wrong person would have our family split up 
And I was hearing these horror stories about if you ever tell anybody that we spank you at all, you're you're going to be put in a foster home and they're going to make you wear pants and go to public school and listen to rock music and horrible things are going to happen. <laughs> I mean, we you laugh because it's ridiculous, but that's terrifying. That's that's terrifying. Is. This is this is terrifying for any child who has potentially been a victim of any kind of abuse. But the I, I want to clarify just how big that fear was for our family, because I think Jill deserves like she is expressing in her book, the amount of pressure that this was. Oh, I'm crying. The amount of pressure that this was on her as a child. And your family wasn't even doing any of this, like Michael and Debbie Pearl to train up a child that Mm -mm. No, my parents were were disgusted by that. And they did not. We were spanked and I don't agree with that. But we were not beaten or or anything that you hear in these much more dangerous stories. But even from what I experienced, I have a lifelong fear of doctors and of CPS. But that is the the depth of fear that is instilled into fundamentalist and homeschooling families about doctors and cps so i you know jill is expressing to us that this was terrifying that it was a lot of pressure so i wanted to add my own voice to hers to validate that part of her story because it it does line up with my personal experience the pressure on her is really mounting she's starting to talk about anxiety and i think if we go take up the offering we can come back and talk about her courtship with derek and then uh, her adult relationship with her parents. Yeah, sounds good. All the spicy stuff is coming in part two, so stay tuned for that. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. Hello, listeners. My name is Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast, a long-format interview-based show that focuses on cults, high-demand groups, captive organizations, and more. Each week, I interview a different cult survivor, who brings a story of coercion and exploitation along with their own fight for freedom. With nearly 200 survivor interviews from all over the world, you can also find deep dives into infamous cults, interviews with leading experts in the field, and understand more about how cults exist all around us and none of us are safe. Each month, I feature a different author on the show who has penned a compelling memoir about their cult experiences which we discuss at length on the show, with copies of their books available to listeners. You will never be short of insightful and moving content here at the Cult Vault Podcast, available on all major platforms. We are back from our break. Uh, so in the first half of the episode, we've talked about some of our general kind of overview thoughts about this book. Now, I think it's time to get into the more... I, I want to say scandalous, the more salacious mm -hmm. details, like the, the stuff that, that we've been seeing highlights of, but actually I want to start by talking about something that maybe wasn't so much said explicitly, but this was kind of the vibe that I got. I sort of got from the way that Jill told it, Jim Bob kind of realized wedding episodes, that courtship announcements, that sort of thing was a big money maker, a big viewership driver for the show. And so then it suddenly became imperative for them to make as much of that content as possible and to monetize that content. Speaking of, did you see that Jessa announced a pregnancy like two days before this book came out? No, but congratulations to her, Mazel Tov. Yeah, congratulations to her. I think that's a suspiciously carefully timed uh, announcement. 
Did, is she still under a contract with Mad Family Inc? Yeah, she's under a lifetime NDA, I assume. Yikes. In contract. So we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. I want to talk. So we're talking about things that happened after 19 Kids and Counting was an established show. And the relationship between Jill and her parents is still pretty good. But there's trouble on the horizon. And this uh, was Jill. Jill was the first one to get married. After Josh. After, uh, right. After Pest and Anna. I like, you know, I don't always like people's snarko nicknames, but I do like his. That's pretty accurate. The idea of Jill courting somebody was really exciting to Jim Bob and to the 19 Kids and Counting producers. Jill and Derek had talked over... FaceTime, of course, you know, chaperoned <laughs> FaceTime and Skype and chaperoned text messages and all of that. And Jill and Jim Bob and the 19 Kids and Counting crew had an opportunity to go hang out with Derek in Nepal for two weeks and get to know him. Well, when push came to shove, they were only, the crew only had the funding to be there for five days. And Jill, this is where Jill really stands up for herself one of the first times. So this is a cool moment to read about, especially from her perspective. She told the crew, you know what? We can go, we can film for five days, but I and my dad are going to stay the whole two weeks because I am not hinging this decision on if I want to, to potentially spend the rest of my life with this person on five days. It's not happening. So she told the crew, I will film a fake goodbye sequence for you on the day that the crew leaves, but we are staying. And she got away with it. The The producer let her do it. I think that the that's sort of kind of one of the things that I've realized is that throughout this show, the producers really it seemed like they almost didn't give a f as long as they got what they were looking for. Yeah, but that's that's reality TV. Yeah. That's just the nature of the game. I don't really see a sinister motive in that. No, I don't really I don't really take particular issue with that because I'm sure that the goodbye that they really did have was quite tearful and was quite emotional because she'd never met him in person and she had to go like it is quite a proposition to say I'm going to go to Nepal to see you because like I know people that have like met people long distance and they've been like you know, they Skype every day, they talk every day, and then they go and they meet in person and they're just like, oh, this is not it. And then they're like with them for like a week. And then when they leave, it's like, well, here's a hug. And on the other hand, I know at least one couple off the top of my head who met that way and are married. I think they've been married for like 13 years. But one thing that I thought was really interesting is Jill is having this negotiation with the producer on how this meeting Derek thing is going to go. And she told, she asked the producer, so what if we go and the relationship aspect of it doesn't work out? You know, we don't have chemistry. We don't end up wanting to be together. Is there any way we can sign something where this will not be aired unless we decide to go ahead with the courtship? And the producer said, no, we're putting money into this. We're putting money into the cruise trip over there. And if you go and it gets filmed, it is going to be aired no matter what. Jill put a lot on the line for Derek to begin with. And fortunately for her, they really did catch feelings for each other. But I thought that was that's just as interesting on so many different levels because she won negotiating with the producer um, in that she got a two week trip instead of a five day trip. And then she also lost because she knew if this courtship didn't work out, it was still going to be very public. And that would be a really big shame for the family. And of course, this is IBLP. So Jim Bob's the one who's picking out mm -hmm. all of the potential suitors for his daughters. And up at the start of the episode, when we were talking about Jim Bob's sort of progression, that time when he said, well, well, God would never tell you to do that. The impression that I got from that conversation was that the guy that was around, um, that Jim Bob kind of had around and was asking, hey, do you want to be on the show? And was making that sort of, well, if you're in the middle of a stadium, you would 
get up there and preach the gospel to everyone when the guy that he was saying that to and the guy was saying no i'd rather do it one-on-one i don't think i need to be on television the impression that i got was that jim bob was looking at that guy as like is this guy a potential match for one of my daughters Ooh, interesting that's sort of because she never said it Mm because but it would make sense to me and i don't know exactly what year this was but it was I I mean I it seems to me like Jill's memory on these sorts of things seems to be very clear in her memory for quotes and her memory for who said what to who when which and I I mean I don't really have any reason to doubt much of the stuff that she's saying in this book um and I don't really see any reason why but like it seems like that would at least be late enough in her childhood and in her life that she would have a very clear fixed memory of it if she can remember that quote that clearly and that conversation that clearly so i but i don't know it could have been somebody that he was looking at for jill or it could have been somebody who he was looking at for somebody else i mean yeah you've got those those five older girls that are all within a few years of each other Jana, jill uh jessa ginger and joanna the only people that that jim bob will pick for his daughters to marry or that he'll pick for his daughters to possibly potentially court and then get engaged and then get married to the first uh, prerequisite for this is you've got to be okay with putting your entire life on television. You've got to be okay with putting the births of your children. You've got to be okay with putting your wedding on. Like if you were like, I really just want a private affair with just the family and just the friends. That's not an option for us. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's that above the whether or not they're a good match. It's that above anything else. Whether you you even believe the same things that we do religiously, if you have the same doctrines, because Derek was not even IBLP. He wasn't even King James Version only. And of course, Jeremy the Calvinist. <laughs> yeah. Famously. That really does seem to be the truth, which you know, from a former IFB perspective sounds absolutely nuts because I was thinking over this kind of concept and I thought, you know, I wonder if we had truly stayed all the way IFB into my adult years and I had somehow met a preacher boy who was Calvinist who wanted to date me and get married to me, would my dad have allowed it? And it, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, knowing your dad, he probably would have sat down with this boy and said, okay, we need to have like a long six or seven hour theological Mm -hmm. discussion to make sure that we're on the same page about X, Y, (laughs) Z. And and my dad was, you know, he was pretty mild for a fundy, even in his most fundy of times. And he was pretty feminist for a fundy, even in his most fundy of times. So he was, you know, generally he didn't, tell me where I had to go to college. Um, He didn't, there was only one occasion where he actually told me I had to not date somebody, but he also really hated Calvinists. (laughs) Uh, Bless his heart, rest in peace. (laughs) But that's really interesting that like the reason he let these not IBLP men get with his daughters was for the show. The thing is, like, Jill doesn't come out and say that. It's speculation based on what she does say. I felt like it was very strongly hinted Implied. at subtext. Yeah. And that really makes sense because by this point, like by season three, season four of 19 Kids and Counting, it's a successful show. They're running long seasons. They're getting paid well, um, although the kids don't know that yet. <laughs> and Jim Bob has always pitched it to the kids as this is our family's ministry and this is what we are called to do. This is what we were supposed to do. So you mentioned earlier that they they had to rehearse their courtship and marriage proposals. That hurt me. Didn't hurt me as bad as the pregnancy announcement did. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Jill and Derek start a courtship in Nepal. They get engaged once he moves back to Arkansas to work as an accountant for Walmart. And so around this time, Derek's mother, uh, Derek's father had died a couple years earlier when he was in, he was a, a young adult. He was in college at that time, I believe. Derek's, and they were still young adults at this time. Derek's mother was diagnosed with uh, stage four cancer, which, which f- sucks. Jill and Derek 
had this wedding that they were planning and they had to plan it around the timeline of is my mother going to live to see this wedding mm -hmm. and thankfully she pulled through and thankfully she actually survived her chemotherapy even though when she initially went to the doctor and she got diagnosed the doctor said basically that you're terminal mm -hmm. but she pulled through and she survived which you know thank god for that but this is about the time when the contract stuff comes up one thing about this book, it really does illuminate what exactly Jill sees in Derek. He is still an unrepentant transpho transphobe and cyber bully of children. And I haven't forgotten that no matter the, no matter if I say a nice thing or two about him here. We'll address that probably later that issue. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address it several times because it deserves to be addressed. <laughs> Derek owes jazz jennings an apology you know i he does not owe the world to change his opinion on what is or isn't a sin but he absolutely owes jazz and the trans community an apology for his unnecessary cruel cyberbullying but jill this i think a lot of us can see that as the primary aspect of his personality and that's that's not invalid. If you know a person through an internet, through the internet, what they've said on the internet is incredibly relevant to what you think of them as a person. And a lot of people will say stuff on the internet that they wouldn't say in real life, but that doesn't mean that just because they said it on the internet, it isn't what they think. A lot of times people are more honest on the internet than they are in person. But we can sometimes see that as like the primary thing and wonder what does Jill see in him? Because we saw those comments as cruel and unnecessary and targeting a child for no reason. I think Jazz was like, gosh, 14 or 15 when all this was going on. Just ridiculous behavior from a grown adult. How, how old is she now? She's like 22, right? She is about 21 or 22. I don't follow her closely, but I had a general idea. I looked this up before the episode. She was born in, yeah, she was, yeah, she was born in 2000. So she probably would have been like 17 or 18. 16, 17, 18, around that age. Yeah. Still under it. It's still like a child that you're yeah. saying to. I think sometimes that cruelty stands out in our mind and we don't see what on earth Jill could possibly see in Derek. But she's talking about him being her rock and being steady, dependable, hardworking. Now, I grew up with a whole gaggle of fundy boys and I knew a lot of lazy fundy boys. And think of... Think of Jim Bob Duggar's sons. How many of them have ever had, I don't know, a construction job where they were not their own boss? Well, there was the one boy that Jim Bob said, you know, I, he took the money I gave and bought a house and then he fixed it up and flipped it. But like, yeah, but, but like these boys have all started businesses with money that their dad just gave them. And none of them are, <laughs> I do not see any of the Duggar boys as particularly hardworking. And I never knew a Fundy Boy with a lot of emotional depth or emotional intelligence. And I think this book makes it so clear what Jill actually sees in him. Because even when they got together way back when, when he was really young, he had all the, all the raw material to be a really great therapy husband. And now he's really developing on that material that he came into the relationship with. And it makes so much more sense, like the way she writes about him, what she sees in him. So uh, let's see, what do we have to say about Jill and Derek's wedding? It had been several years since mm -hmm. one of the Duggars had gotten married. And the sense that I sort of got from reading between the lines of this was that weddings and births and pregnancy announcements are the real money makers on this show. And it had been several years since there had been a wedding and the sense that i sort of yeah. got was that jim bob it, it's almost like he goes into the writer's room is almost how it <laughs> says like what's the plans for this season okay well we're gonna get jill uh in a courtship and we're gonna get her engaged and we're gonna get her married that's the plot for this season and he works that out with a producer yeah it is very truman show <laughs> but so josh and anna had had three children by the time jill got married if i'm remembering correctly from the book and Anna had really struggled with having agency over the footage that was aired of those births, which we're going to circle right back around to in a minute. She, there was footage that was included that she had specifically asked not to have included. 
And that footage was cut in reruns of the show per her wishes. But then it was included in episodes about her future births as flashbacks. So that footage that she did not want to have out there was still being used. And we don't really think of Anna Duggar as one of the people in this family that really exercises a lot of agency over things. That's not really who we see her as. It just seems like if she's saying something about this, then you know something's really wrong. Anna's births and the subsequent births that Michelle had 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 been the moneymakers for the entire TV show. They had been the ratings drivers, and that's why Jim Bob was so focused on uh, Derek and Jill's wedding. I think Jill said in the book there were over 2,000 guests. In all the chaos of planning a 2,000-person wedding, when Derek's mother's life is hanging in the balance, because it was a week before the wedding, Derek got a call that she's dying, you better come to the hospital. And then she miraculously pulled through and attended the wedding on oxygen, like signed an, an AMA to get out of the hospital <laughs> to go to their wedding, and then went and checked herself back in because she was that sick. In the middle of all of that, the morning before the wedding, Jim Bob said to Jill, oh, hey, there's some papers for you to sign on the table about the show. Can you just sign that for me real quick? And Jill goes over to the table. There is a piece of paper for every adult child with their name on it and a signature line. There, the actual contract that she is signing is not on the table, not available to her. And Jim Bob says, hey, can you just sign this? And she signs it without ever reading the actual contract that it pertains to. And he said, "This it's just making sure that we all get paid or something about this is just determining how we all get paid. Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. And this is the thing that starts the snowball rolling down the mountain of all of the events of the rest of the book. I mean, it's incredibly predatory behavior from Jim Bob because what she ended up actually signing was a five-year contract or four and a half to five-year contract to basically agree to meet all TV obligations for the next five years, to put her births on TV, to put her wedding on TV, and to just basically mm -hmm. sacrifice. To be available for all promo material that the show wanted. And this is going to cause some conflict because she does not know that she has signed this contract. So Jim Bob is relying on her obedience to him, even after she is supposedly fully under Derek's authority and not his, to whenever he says jump, she's going to jump, and she doesn't even need to know that she's contractually obligated to jump. Well, shortly after, so it was only a month into Derek and Jill's marriage that she found out that she was pregnant. Mazel tov. And this is when she has to tell the producers before she can tell family members so that they can get the reaction. It was just, okay, well, we need to figure out who we're going to sell the exclusivity rights to the announcement to before we can, before you can tell anybody who's in your family, before you can tell these, we need to get all of this contract stuff worked out. And this was heartbreaking because as somebody who has been pregnant, getting to tell somebody is like the coolest thing. So this is with the pregnancy announcement is when we see our first recorded pushback from Derek. This is a quote from the book. This isn't normal. This is insane, Jill. I don't like being a dancing monkey who has to perform at these stupid photo shoots. And I don't like having to bend to the demands of when and how we're going to post our own family announcements. Valid. She clarifies in the book that his tone was not angry towards her, that he was trying to be as reserved as he could, but he was really mad. So he pitched, um, well, let's just go rogue and put a pregnancy announcement on our Instagram and cheat People Magazine out of the story. Which, She's like, you cannot do that. That has my husband written all over it. Yeah, that's something that he would do. Um, that is absolutely like the first place that his mind would go. So I, th I found that cute and funny because that was a very Jonathan thing to say. So there, there's two people that they're kind of dealing with. So there's Scott is the TV producer. Scott is the guy that Jim Bob and Jim Bob and Scott basically make the show together and plan out what's going to be on the show and, and come up with the ideas for the show. And then there's Chad and Chad is kind of like the guy that they get involved whenever somebody doesn't want to do exactly what they want them to do. They call in Chad and Chad basically gets on the email, 
gets on the phone and basically berates people into doing what he wants. That's sort of how the structure works. Yeah, and then Scott is the producer of 19 Kids and Counting, who the kids called Uncle Scott, and was more compassionate towards the kids and their needs and wants. For a while. To an extent. <laughs> but it's just weird to have like a family dynamic where you have to have somebody who's an enforcer to get all of your family members to do what you want them to do. But I guess mm -hmm. this is extreme patriarchy. This is extreme IBLP patriarchy. So all of this stuff is sort of foreign to me and all of, and it's entirely authoritarian. I guess maybe I shouldn't be too surprised, but that struck me as something that's just so un unhealthy and mm -hmm. alien. So Jill is uh, pregnant with her first child. She's starting to think about labor and delivery. And she knows that her mother's births have been on TV and Anna's births have been on TV. And she honestly does not want to give birth on TV, which is incredibly valid. <laughs> Just so valid. And she's she, what she says to the producer, and I think a lot of people who have given birth can identify, is I have done all this midwife training and I know too well all the things that can go wrong. And I'm already going to be in my head. And if I'm tense because there's a camera crew in the room, I'm never going to be able to actually give birth. That's a really great explanation of why a person would not want their birth to be on TV beyond modesty, or that's a private moment, or that's just for me, or any other number of completely valid reasons. Also, it's, it's this modesty culture where it's, you have to have ankle length denim skirt you cannot wear pants you cannot show your shoulders you cannot wear your hair a certain way you cannot get a nose ring you cannot get a tattoo you cannot do any of these things that are deemed immodest and they're telling you you know don't shake your butt because you don't want people to even think about the fact that you have a butt yeah are they going to like you're you're putting a room full of like camera people and people who i guess they know the people because they filmed with them before but still that's people in the room with you when you're at your most vulnerable terrifying to me <laughs> just ugh. so uh quick quick trigger warning we are going to talk about a um unintended un unplanned c-section and birth trauma coming up and we're going to do it again later in the episode but i'll tw again before that so Jill stands up to Scott and they back and forth and back and forth. And Scott says, well, you know, what if there isn't a crew in the room and I just come in with the camera and get some B footage and then leave. And Jill said, no, I don't want like, look, I care about you. I do not want you in the room when I'm trying to get birth. So the, the compromise that they came to was that Michelle and Jana would have cameras to shoot like home video style videos while jill was giving birth she tried to have a home birth but after three days of labor her baby was breech so cool. she did end up going to the hospital and then eventually having a c-section oh and we skipped the part where uh jill and derek went on a missions trip to el salvador while she was in her third trimester so that she could get away from filming yeah um that'll come back later she has their first son israel uh, you know, the photos are sold to People Magazine and get whatever it happens. She said that even on the operating table holding her kid for the first time, she was thinking about the show and People Magazine and the announcement and all of that, which is pretty, that's tough. Like, as a parent, that's tough to read. That's horrible. It, it gets so much worse. It's and like a month after her baby was born, she got a call from Jim Bob who said, I just got word that a tabloid has information about stuff that happened a long time ago. Stuff that happened between Josh and the girls. Okay, stuff. Jim Bob, every time in this book that he is quoted talking about Josh's abuse of his sisters and another girl, he uses the word stuff or stuff that happened. He also used the phrase between Josh and the girls, which is um, really not the way that we ought to be talking about abuse that was inflicted by one person in a position of power over another person. I also, thirdly, don't like that he said the girls, like they're people with names and 
80% of them are people with names that you gave them. How about you use their names? They're not the girls. They're not an inanimate group of faceless beings. They are your children. Derek, so Jill hears she's warned like a few hours ahead of time that a tabloid has this information and they're trying to shut it down, but they don't know if they're going to be able to shut it down. And then a few hours later, she hears from one of her sisters that it was leaked to the media and the the secret is out. Derek comes home that evening to, and you know, grabs Jill and holds her and he asks how she's doing and she says, I wish I were dead. <sighs> yep. I want to note, Jill writes, so there are multiple places in this book that this 2015 leak is discussed and every single time Jill includes a list of the people that she finds responsible for the leak and if she had said it once, it would have been enough, but her repetition of this tells me that this is important to her. So as a, a you know, I would, I would like to give her respect as a victim and as a survivor by reading her list. The people that Jill holds responsible are In Touch, Bauer, Kathy O'Kelly, Ernest Kate, the City of Springdale, the Washington County Sheriff's Office, and Rick Hoyt. Her talking about how incredibly re-traumatizing it was to hear this in the news really got to me, especially knowing that she was like less than two months postpartum at the time. And she's getting papped constantly. Yeah, people are delivering like fake online shopping packages to her porch and knocking on the door so that she'll open the door and they can get her picture. This just hurt and understanding the IBLP view of modesty and of purity um, and knowing the additional trauma that that adds on top of the trauma of assault is it's heavy. And it, it was, that was a really hard section to read. This revelation, this public revelation of Josh's abuse of his sisters causes a massive crisis for the family. They end up going to, as we said earlier, a retreat, all of them together on this ranch in Oklahoma. And they're all in a room together. Including Josh and Anna and their children. Yes. Josh kind of is a little bit flippant about it. And Michelle chastises him. But Jim Bob and Scott, it seems like their primary focus isn't on, is everybody okay here? Are you guys doing okay? Especially the girls who are having their privacy, who had their privacy violated by the article that was posted by the details of their abuse that was posted trying to do damage control and he's trying to figure out how they can patch this situation up one thing i found really interesting from this little chapter was just one little tiny quote jill says i didn't know how to be around josh although what had happened had been addressed back then and he had apologized many times we didn't talk about what had happened anymore. That's interesting that she says that he had apologized to her. I'm sure that he was made to apologize. Yeah, but apologized many times doesn't sound like made to. And I think that's an interesting insight into the horrific mind of Josh Duggar. It was his own guilt. He did freely confess to what he had done to his mm -hmm. parents. I think that is something that happened before he lost his soul or lost his conscience the way that he clearly did as an adult or as an older adult. So this is where the Megan Kelly interview gets set up. This is like within days of this story breaking and they're all together in this room and they're like, what are we going to do? Not like, um, how, how are we going to protect ourselves from the emotional turmoil that this story is enforcing it's yeah how do we do damage control and keep the money train rolling and keep the show on the air how do we protect the money and how do we protect the family do you ever watch the sopranos or like a mafia mafia shows like or do you ever watch like succession or something like that or yeah i've seen succession parts of it when there's like a crisis or like a criminal indictment hanging around or something like that everyone just kind of comes together in one room and they're just like, what do we do about this? It's how do we circle the wagons and protect the business or the family? Yeah. Everybody's basically called up to be like, you're either with us or you're against us. And if you're with us, you do what you need to do. And it's the women who are the victims of the abuse themselves, Jill and her sisters 
that are the ones who are basically put forward as their solution to this problem Mm -hmm. in this meeting in Oklahoma, in this house, in this cabin that they're in, they're like, what do we do? Well, they're going to cancel the show. What if we do a new show where it's based on Jill and Jessa? What if we put them on TV and put them on an interview with somebody who's possibly friendly to us that we can get to ask softball questions so that we can keep this thing going? I think that it's clear that under this kind of pressure, because we, we've talked about this before, where if in fundamentalism, there's this sort of belief that if you're doing something right, then people are going to come after you and people are going to oppose you and try to tear you down. Mm-hmm. And I think that it seems like under this kind of pressure, Jim Bob's resolve is stronger than ever because he still believes I'm doing the right thing here. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And he's still trying to make plans for his family to be a reality TV family and be this model family for the IBLP, even as they're hiding from paparazzi in a ranch in Oklahoma. Right. Well, four of your daughters are forced to be in a room with their abuser while the story of their abuse by that abuser has just broken and humiliated them on a national stage. And this is where Jim Bob, to me, this is where Jim Bob really starts to lose the plot. I think this is where we see it first or where it first becomes possibly apparent or it would become apparent to somebody like Jill. But so Jill and Jessa set up the interview with Megyn Kelly. And that was one of the really big bombshells from this book that Josh Dyer was in the room while they did their Megyn Kelly interview. I audibly gasped when I read that bit. Did you want to read that quote that you had written down from this part? About the interview, she says, it was agony. It was so painful that I didn't stop to ask why Josh was allowed to be there in the first place. (laughs) There are a lot of times that specifically referencing this abuse and the fallout from it years and years and years later, she uses words like agony or torture. Um, I just, I don't doubt her. No, this is, this is, this is, yeah. Like, I, like, this is, this is unconscionable. Like, the other thing, like, I, I get, Jim Bob saying, yeah, Josh can be in the room because it's f-ing Jim Bob. I already didn't think Megan Kelly was a real journalist. How, like, if you're a journalist and you're doing this sort of thing, how are you okay with saying, yes, I'm a journalist? I, and, and this was at a time when Megan Kelly was at least like, I mean, she was on Fox News and their journalistic ethics are pretty much non existent. And they were as well at the time that this happened. And she was one of their hosts, one of their anchors, but she was still of the people that were regulars on that channel. She was still a personality that was somewhat more respected. How do you agree to just do this as basically a PR favor to somebody like Jim Bob, to somebody who is, who is doing this specifically to protect an abuser? I don't like I to me that well, how do you not get your camera guys to quote unquote accidentally catch Josh in a shot and then edit that into the final broadcast to at least expose like as a journalist, you want you would want to expose that the the family that's the family dynamic that you're witnessing. I have a you wrote down another quote from this section. I'd spend I'd spent most of my life listening to the IBLP teaching on the umbrella of protection. When I needed it most, it had failed me. It felt as though I, as a woman, was expected to do all I could to protect Pops and Josh. Nobody appeared to see it differently. She talks so much about how she was terrified, not of going to hell, not of what her eternal fate would be, but what would happen to her if she disobeyed her father. She did everything that she was supposed to do, and she still got destroyed she goes back to el salvador and she's describing the conditions of her mission trip in el salvador um later it gets much 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 worse but she's describing how violent it is and how there is no ac no wi-fi no electricity and she's got a three-month-old newborn baby 
and she runs away to El Salvador to this situation mm-hmm. because she wants to get away from the publicity and she wants to get away from the paps. Of course, the paparazzi do track them down even in El Salvador. The, at, meanwhile, Counting On had started up. So the original 19 Kids and Counties was, ca- was canceled, but Counting On immediately took over. Um, Jill had less filming obligations while she was living in El Sal- Salvador, and she and Derek were both really happy with that because she said she was working about 20 hours a week on filming when they still lived in Arkansas. They were in El Salvador. She was pretty happy there, but money was tight. The And Chad, the, the Jim Bob's helper guy, was helping them fundraise for their mission and taking a cut of whatever he raised for them, which Jill doesn't appear to find incredibly shady. That is extremely shady. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, maybe I'm being too nice to her. Maybe I'm not, but I feel like maybe she just hasn't processed that part yet. She's got some other shit to deal with first. Let's just let her get there on her own. I mean, I think that Derek would at least find that shady. Yeah. See, I feel that Derek's Twitter bullying may be misplaced anger at all the shady business that his wife has been subjected to. That does not make it okay, but I certainly know men who do this. They're mad about one thing, so they go say some stupid shit about another thing. You ever know, especially cis men who do this? Oh, you're talking about me? (laughs) I do do this all the... Every time I tweet about how, like, I don't know, they got to ban qr code menus at restaurants is because i'm mad about something else (laughs) i was not talking about you with that so much but men seriously this is a man thing um as much as i put very little stock in like man things or girl things women things um this is absolutely a cis man thing that a lot of y'all do so i kind of think that's what he was doing again it does not make it okay but that's why I think he was so aggressive on other topics on Twitter. Well, Derek is worried about money and he asks Jim Bob if they can potentially get paid for working on the TV show Counting On. And this is where things go buck wild until the end of the book. Jim Bob comes down to visit them in El Salvador. Uninvited. Uninvited. to Because they'd been... Yeah, there was a promo shoot for Counting On that the Counting On people wanted Jill to attend. And Jill said, I can't attend. I'm in El Salvador. And they said, you have to. You have a contractual obligation. And she said, I have a what now? I've never signed a contract. Yep. And they're like, yes, you did. We have it right here. And she's like, can I see it? And they say no. Um. Yep. And then she asks her dad, can I see the contract that you had me sign the day before my wedding when I thought my mother-in-law was dying and there were 2,000 people coming to my wedding in like 14 hours? And he's like, oh, yeah, Jim Bob is like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Let me just go find that. And then he'd go radio silent. And then she'd ask him again. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, I found it's a 28 page contract. But for some reason, I only found like six pages of it. And they're not in order or sequential. But here's six pages of the contract. And then repeat that for two years, basically breadcrumbing Re- them along. Yes, repeat that for an incredibly long time. Uh, until Jim Bob starts making threats, but we'll get there. When they didn't meet their contractual obligations, Jim Bob like basically lost his shit and got mad at them. And they're just like, okay, that was crazy. Uh, let's not talk to them for a minute. And then they come uninvited and unannounced to where they're doing their mission strip. And Derek asks Jim Bob if they can get any money for the work that they've been doing on the TV show. And Jim Bob says that they used to pay Josh but they don't anymore, which is wild that they used to pay Josh, but not any of the others. Because he is incredibly useless. He is an incredibly useless man. He, I mean, he never did anything. He wasn't even good at running a car dealership. Like all of the jobs that these people get are jobs that they get either because their parents are rich or their parents are well-connected. He didn't do anything at FRC either. He, I mean, he would basically just kind of be there and be just kind of dumb on camera and not do or say anything useful. And people would just make fun of him and be like, he's the oldest son. So he's like the. Yeah. He has never added value to anyone's life ever, except for a small number of people who he has paid money to. He has given money to 
because he felt like that was what he needed to do to look like a good person. No, so so Derek asks for money, and what did Jim Bob say? Because this is this is golden. This f-ing quote to me, I w- I read this. I'm like, what? You, like, on what planet does this man spend most of his time? <laughs> not like he's not mormon so it's not going to be like one of the heaven planets that you get he says you've done some work but so has everyone else so it averages out in the long run which i like what he's saying is he's like well everyone does work on the show i do work on yeah, the show you do but he's the, the one you work keeping, on the show he's the one keeping all the money like he's saying well we all do work on the show but that's not an excuse for you to get all the money and me to get no <laughs> money like what if I had 19 kids and $8 million money? <laughs> so Jim Bob asks, what do you think you're worth? $10 an hour, $12 an hour. That's what I pay some of the others who work for me. And I assume that he's talking about people who work at like the various car lots that he owns and yeah. various businesses that he owns. He's like $10 an hour, $12 an hour. Wait, wait, is, is that what you're worth? And Derek, to his credit, doesn't f-ing take shit from Jim Bob. Derek comes back at him and says, we're providing value for this show. And the value that we're providing is not replaceable in the same way that somebody who works $10 or $12 an hour at a car dealership is replaceable. Uh, Coming from people who have worked for minimum wage at a car dealership, both of us. Yeah. Oof, yeah. That was where although we it was a legal car dealership. Yeah, not a uh, where I don't have specific allegations about anybody uh, downloading illegal materials. So, some context for the work that Jill and Derek are doing down in El Salvador. I'm sure, as many of you have heard, that El Salvador has um, serious problems with gang violence. That is like a continuing issue, and that's actually worse now than it was at the time in. I think 2015 about when they were yeah this is 2015 it's even worse now than it was then where they would essentially there would be all these gangs like you know ms-13 was one of the big ones and they would conscript all of the young men to joining these gangs and if you didn't join then they would kill you if you were involved in the church and if you were going to church and you were really Christian, then they wouldn't conscript you. They would leave you alone. And so they were basically down there trying to help run this church so that these people wouldn't get these, these young men wouldn't get sucked into this life of violence and wouldn't get killed or wouldn't get kidnapped or ransomed, things like that. And, you know, this is really life and death situation. Jim Bob comes down and they're asking him for more financial support on this show that they've been working on. Derek asks him, what's your show worth? Because he's an, he's an accountant. He asks for some details about the deal with TLC. And Jim Bob's response is this, we are reaching more people on the show than you are reaching here on the mission field. In case anybody doesn't speak fundy and can't figure it out from context clues, that is an awful thing to say, especially to somebody like you you know that you know on this show we have our issues with international missions um and feel like too often that is just colonialism with a jesus face on face on it but we look slightly more kindly on people who are in international missions that are actually helping people as in feeding them clothing them actually materially helping people as opposed to simply trying to convert them to American Christianity. That is an absolutely abhorrent thing to say in, in fundy language. Uh, mm, Sorry, that makes me pretty angry. Yeah. And I mean, it's worth pointing out El Salvador is a culturally Christian nation is a culturally Catholic nation. So it's not as if they're the, 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 colonialization work has already been done there and exactly jim bob exactly how many people who were not already christian do you think you are reaching with your tv show do you really think that the the atheists and unchurched americans are sitting down on to watch tlc and then getting jesusified because of your show like really his whole thing and he says this time and time again is he says he wants to show everybody that children are a blessing yeah as as much as he wants to be that for 
that that model family for the IBLP, he also wants to show that children are a blessing. And as soon as his children stop being the exact blessing that he wants at that moment, mm -hmm. then he, he just like flips and he becomes a different person. And I mean, I've known people who would have be behavior that was similar to this, where they were kind to you. They were the nicest person in the world as long as you were doing what they wanted. And then as soon as you did something that they didn't want, they treated you like you were garbage. During this time when Jill and Derek are there in El Salvador, they are trying to get information on what contract Jill had signed under false pretenses. They are being given the runaround by absolutely everybody. And then this is when the Ashley Madison scandal broke. Jill did just directly text Josh like, hey, what happened? And she did not receive a text back. So this is when Josh would have gone to the Reformers Unanimous home. Jill gets sucked back into counting on because now there is yet another need for her to cover for her brother, abusive pedophile. Every single time there's a crisis, it's always Jill and Jessa and Ginger that are relied on to be like, oh, one of you's got to get married now. One of you's got to have another. Like, Well, have I told you why I think it's always those particular kids? Why? They're the ones who were already married. So them being the faces of their assault and protecting their assaulter does not reduce their value on the IBLP marriage market. Do you think that has something to do with why Jim Bob was willing to marry them off to men who weren't in the IBLP? I think it's possible. I think we'll have to wait and see who the younger girls marry before we make that call. That is in my head though. Because I always, I just wonder, knowing a guy like Jim Bob is a KJVO guy he believes that if you read a bible that isn't the king james version of the bible you are reading heresy you are reading a a corrupted text that that will have horrible impacts on the rest of your life that is what this man believes that's what his branch of fundamentalism teaches i get the feeling that he is a man who views iblp men as so invaluable that I think that in his head, he, he believes that it would be wrong or dishonest or bad of him or immoral of him in some way to let an IBLP man marry his daughters who he sees as damaged goods. I don't disagree with that thought, which is super, super up. That's a f***ed up thing. We got to kind of speed run through the next couple years of contract obligations so we can get to where it starts to fall apart for Jill. Yeah, this is a long book. We'd recommend that you read it because it's... Oh, absolutely. There, there is so much that we are having to skip to get through this book. It's I highly, I absolutely recommend it. Jim Bob tries to drive wedges between Jill and Derek. He asks questions like, is this you or is this Derek being the problem here? He threatened them with a lawsuit and then later on he will threaten them with cutting them out of the will and then in 2016 jill and derek and their children are back or their first child are back in arkansas jim bob offers a one-time eighty thousand dollar payment but if you if you take the payment you've got to sign an infinite contract for yourself your children and any unborn children to work for Jim Bob at an undisclosed, non-negotiable pay rate and a lifetime NDA. Oh, and by the way, don't go stirring contention among the brethren. Which means don't ask your brothers and sisters if they're going to sign the contract or not, or discuss with them the details of what's in the contract and whether or not you think it's fair. Yep. Jim Bob ended up giving Jill and Derek the $80,000, even though they did not sign that contract, but they are still working on the show. They just didn't, sh they didn't sign a new contract. That $80,000 feels like a, I'm giving you this money. Now you have to work for me. Mm -hmm. like it, yeah. That's that felt like really dirty, like guilty. So Jill and Derek um, decide to permanently quit 
counting on because they have an opportunity with a new mission board and this mission board will not take them on if they are still working on counting on. So they decide, you know, what we really feel like we're called to do is work in missions. We are going to quit the show. We're going to go on to work in missions. But in order to be accepted by this new mission board, they needed proof that they were terminate. They had terminated their contracts with TLC and they were not under any contractual obligations. Well, guess how that went trying to get proof of that. Well, Jim Bob says that they're under contract until 2019, mm -hmm. but it turns out that maybe that wasn't actually true because they never actually saw the contract and, and when that contract went until, so they didn't know. And they were trying to get copies of this and they couldn't get it. And Jim Bob has given them the runaround again. He's giving them the, I don't, oh yeah, I'll get you that contract at some, at some point. I just got to find it. And then months more of silence and TLC is giving them the same kind of runaround. They did official exit interviews for Counting On that were never aired. So they never got to say goodbye the way they wanted to. And according to Jill, Derek was not fired from Counting On for his cyberbullying of Jazz Jennings. Um, they actually voluntarily quit. This is maybe the one thing in the book that I feel a little bit of doubt about. Interesting. When I first read that, I was like, is that for real? Is that how it actually happened? And because I remember reading, yeah, that's why he was fired. But then I went back and looked it up and all of the magazine, like the People magazine articles and the, the or like Us Weekly, those tabloid magazines that were saying that Derek was fired due to that. They were all saying it's rumored that Derek was fired due to that. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're not on the show anymore. Right. But they never actually had confirmation. That's like something that people speculated about and people talked about, but there was never any official confirmation about it. The reason why I am somewhat inclined to believe this story from Jill is because their contract was not with TLC. Their contract was with Mad Family Inc., which was Jim Bob's company. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that Mad Family, that Jim Bob would voluntarily terminate Jill or Derek from his production company because that would be him giving up his power over them. I especially don't think that, e like, even if TLC was leaning on them, and he did have to have to officially terminate them from it. I don't think that he would tell them that they had been terminated. I would not say that I think Jill is lying about this story by any means. I would say I think there are a lot of moving parts to that story. And I think maybe Jill is not telling us all of them. Not that she's obligated to. This is It's her book. It's her story. But I do think with specifically Derek's like online persona, I think Jill feels a little bit obligated to protect him and make him look good, which is a thing that a lot of spouses do for each other that aren't in a cult or in the process of leaving a cult. And also, um, this isn't Derek's book. It's not from his point of view. So that's another valid reason for her to not go into this as much as I wish she had. And she does um, mention, wh what's the phrasing that she uses? I wrote it down. Let me find it in our... It was something about speaking his mind online. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to read the actual quote that she says when she brings this up? Yeah. Derek had been making comments on Twitter, speaking his mind about various topics and making a few enemies. That's a very interesting way of saying it. Derek had been cyberbullying a transgender teenager. Yeah. But she she clearly claims that that was not the reason that he was fired. Around this time, Jill has their second child and again, a trigger warning for birth trauma and C-section. Jill suffers a uterine rupture during the uh, attempted VBAC and then later C-section with Samuel. The baby is injured. She is injured. Both of them almost died. And... Jim Bob is out in the hallway trying to get baby pictures to sell to People magazine and making jokes about her still being able to have children. To me, this was this was part where like I had I was not a fan of Jim Bob. This is the part where I was like, this man is a f***ing psychopath. She like the, she, she the the story that she tells in the book about this birth is f***ing traumatic to read. Yeah, it was 
it was truly horrifying. Yeah, and if it's horrifying our friends without uteruses, <laughs> it's doubly horrifying to especially those of us who have uteruses and have used them for reproduction and would maybe do that again one day. I mean, she just I mean, when she was saying how much pain that she was in. Mhm. Mm that they made my skin crawl. I, I'm not going to go into any of the the graphic details of the stuff that she says, but it's it's in there if you want it, and if you don't want to read it, I'd suggest you skip that section of the book. She reads a text on Jim Bob's phone from Chad, who is basically the enforcer for Scott for TLC. Basically, when somebody doesn't do what they want, then they bring in Chad. Get me pics of that baby sending messages to Jim Bob. Mm -hmm. Surv she is within an inch of her life here. Really? True, like truly, she is within an inch of her life here. She says, I don't know if I'll if I'll be able to have children again. Jim Bob's like, oh, I, I hope what what? Like he's like freaking out about this. This is the thing that freaks him out more than the fact that his, his daughter almost died. Mm -hmm. to me, like that to me, that hurt me to read so much. Just not not just like the the pain, but like the my dad cares more about m my ability to have children than whether or not I live or die. But although the gulf between Jill and her parents is growing, she still has a lot of support from her siblings, which I think is interesting. Um, an interesting family dynamic. Like they've had all of these struggles and disagreements with her dad over the payment for the show and this, that, and the other. But when they needed to move, all of the siblings still showed up to help her move. And she was, they were still living in a house that belonged to the family because even amidst all this struggle, the, the ta uh, tangible support was still there, which is, that's an interesting dynamic. Uh, I had one more little quote from this section. She mentions the recovering and grace, the recovering grace blog and Bill Gothard's uh, scandals. I shouldn't just say scandals. I should say his sexual assault of teenage girls and young women. Jill says, it didn't matter how much Derek and I talked about building our lives together, what future I dreamed of or how badly I wanted to begin again, I felt stuck. I felt like I was in chains and I couldn't break free from the past. My heart was open to the possibility of a new life, but my head was full of reasons why I couldn't. For every whisper of hope, there was an avalanche of guilt. For every moment of joy, there was a stab of fear. I had the IBL I had IBLP to thank for that particular baggage. Ever since I was a kid, every decision I'd made had been gripped with a level of guilt or fear that weighed heavy in my decision making. Over time, I'd gotten so used to it that I hardly noticed it was there. But now that I'd walked away from the family ministry and we were beginning to change in other areas, I just couldn't ignore it. And she talks about her guilt over whether she'll be able to bear more children or not, which is, again, incredibly heartbreaking. She almost dies. She says, I don't know if, if my body will let me do this again and survive. And they're going to have to use some form of birth control because she cannot immediately go get pregnant again because she really, truly might die. And she's not worried about what if she dies? She's worried about what if somebody figures out that I'm using birth control? This is one of the major catalysts for her starting to deconstruct her mm -hmm. religious belief. And she feels really she feels really isolated. They get into a non King James only church and she has some connections there. And that's kind of her refuge from drama that is not yet even reached ahead with her family. She wonders if she wants to wear pants and this she spends like pages and pages talking about this whole pants struggle, which is really something because I, I really uh, identify with that. She asks Derek if she should wear pants and he's like, I don't know. What do you want to do? She's like, but, but, but Deuteronomy 22, five. And Derek's like, eh, it was cultural back then men wore robes. I don't think it's the same thing. Um, Ginger or Jill really wants Derek to just tell her it's okay to wear pants or it's not okay to wear pants. But Derek is really digging his heels in and not doing that for her. He wants her to come to it her herself, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, this is another thing that, that made me like Derek a little bit more. I, I think what we're seeing from her portrayal of him, she does a really great job of portraying him as kind, reasonable, and loving towards his wife. And 
would love to stand him if he could stop being an unrepentant transphobic cyber bully. It sucks when that's like the peak is you can be either like Derek, who is transphobe cyber bully, or you can be Jeremy, who is preachers and sneakers wannabe, or you can be, I don't know, what what does Ben Seawald do? Ben Seawald is one Anything? of those Theo bros. Oh, oh God. And he wears a lot of hats. And then Austin leaves dangerous items unattended around their children. That sucks. So <laughs> you see why Derek is clearly the best. It's like asking who's the best dictator. Is it Stalin? Is it Mao? Is it Hitler? Is it Pol Pot? Is it yeah. Mussolini? Who killed the least? Who's the least bad? Who did, who's the least murdering? No. Um, but I will take it all back, Derek. If you hear this, I will take it all back. If you simply apologize for your transphobic cyberbullying, I don't care what your opinion on what is or isn't sin is. That's that's between you and your God. But you do you got to apologize for the bullying part. Sadie, if Derek gets if if Derek apologizes to Jazz Jennings, will you get a Derek Dillard giving like a thumbs up tattoo on your butt cheek? <laughs> no, because my butt is reserved for the Jelly Venus de Milo. However, I will get a t-shirt <laughs> of Derek Derek Dillard giving a thumbs up. Yeah. Being like just dilling it. <laughs> yes. I will get a t-shirt. I will wear a t-shirt. Um if Derek apologizes to Jazz Jennings. I did want to read this little quote just for levity because this is like ex this is also another place that Derek really reminded me personality wise of my husband, um, who is not a transphobic cyber bully, but has a similar personality. So Jill has like gotten a pair of leggings because she's going to go to Silver Dollar City and she's so nervous about wearing pants out in public for the first time. And this is like really, really crazy and hard for her as she gets dressed. She's got uh, leggings and she's got a long T-shirt. And then a coat that's like almost knee length that covers the t-shirt. So she's hoping she doesn't look like she's wearing pants too much. Quote, what do you think? I asked Derek just before his mom arrived. It's fine. He said, checking his watch. No, I'm wearing pants, Derek. He paused and looked at me. You look great. And it's practical too. You'll be fine. <laughs> that like very nonchalant, never fundy response is very on brand for my personal husband. <laughs> Oh yeah, I can see that. The thing that Derek does here is that he is like asking her about is this a sin issue or is this a personal conviction? Which is like in the IBLP, once you start to do that like that's like the Barbie, you know, once her foot goes flat. Ooh. Good analogy. And I want to read this quote because she says maybe authority wasn't always totally trustworthy. I mean, that's like kryptonite to the mm -hmm. IBLP. So the problem with the wearing pants thing, her first outing wearing pants, they went to Silver Dollar City with Derek's family, but she didn't check the Duggar family schedule first because she had been cut out of like some of the group chats. She wasn't on particularly good ter terms with her parents. And it just so happened that the entire D Duggar family was at Silver Dollar City on the same day that she happened to go wearing pants for the very first time ever. So she tried to hide from them the entire day and it's hard to hide from like 20 people in a small theme park. And she managed to like avoid her parents. And one time she spoke to her parents across a hedge. So the hedge is hiding the bottom half of her body and they don't know that she's wearing pants, which is uh, hilarious in any other situation. But one of her siblings did happen to see her in pants and ratted her out to her dad. And then Jim Bob has this whole incredibly awful conversation with her about it. He pulls her aside the next time that she's at their house. He takes her up to a private place and he says, were you wearing pants the other day? And shames her because Ginger, now Ginger had already worn pants in public. It was a whole media thing. But Ginger called her parents and explained her reasoning for wearing pants before she ever did it. So he shames Jill for not for not letting them know ahead of time. And I think it's abundantly clear at this point, he just wants to come down on Jill. He wants to assert his authority. He wants to assert his power to still make her feel that shame and guilt as she is starting to imagine a life without that shame and guilt. And this is just, this is awful. 
especially because of the next things that occur. But so next, uh, I, I, I like this part from her because she gets a nose ring. I got a nose ring so we can be nose ring buddies. Um, yeah. So the whole thing about the pants was that Jim Bob shamed Jill because Ginger let her parents know ahead of time before she did the wearing the pants. And he shamed Jill because she didn't call them with a list of biblical reasons before she went and did it. So Jill decides she's going to get a nose ring and she wants, she still wants to be the good girl. She still wants this approval. So she calls her parents before she gets a nose ring and they're not together. So she has to make two different phone calls. And Michelle is just, it picks up the phone and is just like, okay, thanks for telling me. And Jim Bob doesn't pick up the phone. So she leaves him a voicemail. And when she leaves the tattoo parlor, having gotten her nose ring, she has an incredibly angry voicemail from Jim Bob back, flip out on her, telling her that she's ruined his life or ruined her life. And can you imagine, Gavi, can you just, just take a step back from the whole duggerness of the situation? A father and grandfather in his 50s a former state senator being this mad about a very normal piercing in his married mid 20s daughter's nose. Well, I do subscribe to the r slash insane parents on Reddit. <sighs> yes. Actually, the insane parents subreddit is actually really kind of a depressing place because it is stuff like my dad saw on instagram that i got a tattoo and he sent me eight bible verses and now i'm depressed like that's mm -hmm. the vibe of a lot of it or is my dad dead named me eight times in text messages and tells me that he doesn't know me anymore like it's it's that type of shit and you're just like oh this sucks if, 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 if it is it is that type of energy it is insane parents energy and he's so he does um he texts her bible verses about honoring your father and mother he starts bombard bombarding her with Bible verses and their relationship just does not get better from this point. And that's when we find out about Jim Bob's possible tax fraud. Yes. Jim Bob, it turns out, had been telling the government that he had been paying all of his children during the- For years. For years. For a- de I, I mean, it was almost a decade at this point. They, they found out because Derek was applying for student loans to go to law school and the government was like, no, you can't have as much student loan as you think you need because you've made all this money in the past few years. The form came back, well, no, you've had $130,000 of reported income from the TV show. And Jill says they had never seen a penny of that money. So they wrote a massive letter to Jim, Bob, and Michelle just laying out every single beef that they ever had with them. This does not go over particularly well. I kind of want to read this letter. I don't have that letter. I do have a text that she sent to Jim, Bob shortly after the nose piercing. So she got her nose pierced. He's texting her, honor thy father and mother. He asks her to get on a phone call with himself and Michelle. She says, no, and this is the text that she sends. Honestly, I don't really feel like talking when I feel like there might be a chance I'm just going to be verbally abused, manipulated, and emotionally hurt. It makes me want to shy away from any type of conversation. I don't want a relationship to be this way, Daddy. And I know we aren't always going to agree on everything, but we won't want to ask for counsel if we feel like we aren't going to be heard. And you are only going to attack us and insist that your view is the way we should see things too. And it goes on and she, I, I just want to have good relationships with you and mama and our siblings, even if we are on the same page with things. I know we know you still have littles in the house and that creates a different dynamic that you have to look out for them, but we don't want to feel like you have to turn against us, turn us against each other either. I know you will have to talk with them about differences and convictions like the nose ring thing, but I do feel like you have a lot of control over how they view us. And it's, we love you. We love you. We know this is hard. We love you. We love you, but I'm not getting on a call because I feel like you're just going to yell at me. Watching Jill learn to set boundaries with her parents was extreme. Like it was painful to watch her go through it, but it was also extremely cathartic to actually get to this point mm -hmm. and see her doing that. This is, this is chronologically when the thing happens where the missions organization turns them down because they cannot get proof that they're not under contract with TLC any longer. And pretty shortly after the missions board turns them down, 
they find out that actually the contract ended in 2018, even though Jim Bob told them it was until 2019. So they did the law school application, the lawsuit that uh, Jill, Ginger, Jessa, and Joanna had filed against In Touch Magazine for leaking their story of abuse in the first place was underway. They wrote this massive letter, 27 pages long. It didn't go over very well. And that's when they found out about the $130,000 beyond the original $80,000 that had been supposedly paid to them that Jim Bob had never paid them. They are texting and emailing him saying, you know what, you could just make this right by just paying me the $130,000 now. How much did he pay to settle Josh's Danica Dillon situation? I don't think we know, but do you want to bet it's $130,000? They ask Jim Bob for the $130K that he claimed on his taxes and on Jill's taxes, he had already paid them. Jim Bob, um, one interesting tidbit, Jim Bob at one point claimed that he had already tithed on this money <laughs> on That's his children's incredible. behalf. That is... Which is <laughs> to where I would like to ask, considering that Jim Bob, as far as we know, has not been the member of a local New Testament church for quite a while and has been running his own home churches. Where did you tithe that money? Where did where did 13K? He probably gave it to Bill Gothard. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he did. Jim Bob also, quote, noticed a spirit of ungratefulness. So this is where the, like, the excerpt that dropped uh, where she has this very tense mediation session with Jim Bob and Michelle and ends up yelling at him. You treat me worse than my pedophile brother because I have pants and I wear a, no a nose ring. That's where this happened before his email with the most audacity that has ever been put into an email. That email was shocking to me. We're going to get, I'm going to read his whole email. We're going to get to his email. <laughs> Cause he's nickel and diming them for every penny that he's ever spent on having children over the entire course of their lives and saying, this is how much we spent on you. So we're deducting that from your. <laughs> so she wanted to address the money in this mediation session that they had that got very, very physically and verbally intense. And it didn't come up because there was too much other shit to talk about. And that's when they sent him an email, just like, pay us the $130,000. Why don't we do that so we can get this relationship back on track? Because that's clearly what you owe us. This is the email that they got back from Jim Bob. Jill and Derek, we love you both and want to see our differences resolved. I have been praying and fasting about all of this. I need to share my heart with you. I have made some bad decisions along life's way and have hurt you all. I am sorry about that. I was wrong for things I have said and done, and I pray you will please forgive me. Mm hmm. Good start. If he had stopped there, if he had stopped there, that would have <laughs> maybe been good. Yes, we allotted at different times amounts to our children for tax pur purposes, because each one of our children were benefiting from having all of their needs met. Food, clothing, shelter, utilities, music lessons, education, travel, instruments, vehicles, phones, medical insurance, medical bills. Here are some low numbers on what was approximately spent on Jill in the last few years. He goes on to give exact amounts for the rent that she would have paid on an apartment had she not lived at their house. Utilities, midwife, education, Honda Pilot, Harp, furniture, parentheses. If you don't want the furniture, we will buy it back after four years of use <laughs> for $3,000 when it was originally worth five. Cell phone, car insurance, vehicle fuel, eating out, clothes and goodwill on family debit cards, eating at home, eating at home three times per day times 12 years for $13,140. It, and then it, the email ends, uh, gift to Dillard Family Ministries, $10,000. You paid yourself a salary from this, stated there was only 1200 left when you closed it out, so you must have eventually received it. You can refund this ministry gift, and we will give it to you directly if you want us to. $129,940 is just the beginning of Jill's expenses paid by the Duggar family over the last several years. Most of this was made and spent on Jill before you two were married. And then he goes on to nickel and dime them for the AC in the home in El Salvador, the stove, the washing machine. The total on Jill's tax returns was $130,250. We would be willing to write a check for $20,000 to settle this once and for all. And this is when it gets really bad. As if that weren't, weren't bad enough. Jill, when mom and I pass on, you are set to receive one nineteenth of everything we own that is set up in a trust for you kids. If you attack us, 
probably your inheritance will be lowered significantly. I love you, but I am grieved by the disrespect and the accusations that continue. I have asked for forgiveness, and I hope that you will also. You have also deeply offended your mother and I. We love you and forgive you for the things you have said and done. $20,000 is a one-time offer. Take it or leave it. Please let me know by Monday night or the amount will be zero. Love, Daddy Duggar. I have to hand it to Jim Bob because I was not expecting him to be leaving any money to the girls. I thought that he would just say, well, the money only goes to the boys. Every time Jim Bob is like, I'm going to change my ways. It's like in Dragon Ball Z when Frieza is like, I haven't even reached my final <laughs> form of horribleness. Yeah. But this, like this section here, I'm, I was astounded reading this this was i like i i am at a loss for words right now i don't like i don't even know how to react to this this twenty thousand dollar one-time offer respond by monday gets turned into a series of twenty thousand dollar one-time offers respond by monday respond by this day respond by that day when they don't take him up on his, his initial offer which of course still includes signing an nda jim bob sends some of jill's siblings by the house to try to talk her into it and like he's pitting the kids against each other and that's really shady can you talk about michelle bringing the contract to them yeah so eventually jill and derek they just want to know what they what what their contract says what they are legally obligated to and they hire a lawyer and the lawyer says send us this contract send us this ta all of these tax documents we need all of it because it pertains to us and jim bob doesn't do it and jim bob doesn't do it and jim bob doesn't do it and eventually jim bob starts like trying to go around the lawyer and talking to jill and derek personally and and trying to mediate the situation with them and still trying to rope them into taking twenty thousand dollars and signing an nda and they'll just say like please just speak to our lawyer like please just talk to our lawyer and then he will give them breadcrumb them more over text and email yeah and eventually it gets to the point where michelle steps in and she goes to the dillard's house late one night and knocks on the door jill and derek see her car outside and they don't answer the door because they're like that's mom's car we don't want to talk to her they get a text message from her saying i dropped off the contract it's on your front porch i left it between the screen door and the and 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 the actual door to the house and they go down and they get it. And this is where they find out that the contract didn't go until 2019 like they thought it did. It ended in 2018. And if they had been able to tell this missions board that they were trying to get on the missions team with, that they were able to actually be out of their contract halfway through 2018, they would have been able to get approved for this mission that takes four years or so to get approval for. But instead, they had to start over. Instead, they had to start this whole process over and their life had been completely derailed by Jim Bob just wanting to have full control over his family and full control over his daughters and not even letting them know what they're obligated to just saying, obey your father, obey your mother and do what we say and there will be no problems. So this started kind of a um, silent, relatively silent period between Jill and her parents they're like low contact at this point. Yeah, very low contact through 2020, um, except for when Jim Bob saw a picture of Derek drinking one single beer and offered to send him to rehab. He offered to send him to the Reformers Unanimous. <laughs> to Reformers Unanimous for his one single beer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jill also like learns to drink during this time. She finds out she doesn't like wine and she does like pina coladas. That was funny to to hear her say she she and Derek talked long and hard about whether or not no. alcohol was a sin. Like, and we've had so many listeners write messages to us and write letters to us or post comments in the Facebook group saying, "I talked about whether or not alcohol was a sin for a long time before I decided that I wanted to try it, and the first thing that I tried was I don't know a a, a rainier." Or like, <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> like the first thing that I, I went with a friend to a cocktail bar and had very fancy cocktails made for me so that I could get the real thing. Or there were some people who were just like, yeah, the first alcohol I bought was MD 2020. A lot of people, it's Jill's story. It was wine and they hated it. <laughs> That's a very common. Yeah. Maybe the, the wine they got was too dry. Maybe they should have gotten something a little. Well, everybody to starts with you. everybody starts with like a like hefty red wine, and then they can't figure out why they hate it off the bat. Well, if it's Pinot Noir, then it's dry. If they'd gone for like a Merlot, then maybe it'd be a little sweeter. If they they, they should have gone with Manischewitz. I'm surprised they didn't go with Manischewitz because that's the the kosher wine. You know, you're following all the rules with that one. Like more, it's also like sweeter than grape soda. It's made with the same grapes that they make grape juice with. It's like the Kool-Aid of wine. The father of somebody who married into the Duggar family around this time was asking Jill for her side of the story because I guess Jim Bob had been bad mouthing his daughter to everyone and basically mm -hmm. saying that she's not obedient and you can't trust her. Yeah. And do, do we know who that was? So it's the father of someone who was engaged to one of Jill's siblings. So I don't think anybody was engaged during the trial, except for Daniel Keller and Hannah Reber. But those aren't Jill's siblings. The, the most th recent three weddings that happened around the time of the Carlot and trial were Justin and Claire in February 2021, Jedediah and Katie in April 2021, and Jeremiah and Hannah in March of 2022. So I know a little bit about Claire's family and almost nothing about Hannah's family. For some reason, my gut reaction is that it's Katie's dad, although it also could be Claire's dad. And we know that Cl that Claire's dad is a little bit on the chill side for IBLP because Claire's family has always worn pants. It makes sense that you would want to know the family that your child is marrying into because I'm sure that they mm -hmm. know, okay, the Duggars, they're a little messy publicly but what's actually going on here but they around this time is when the raid happens at the car lot jim bob says nothing's going on there was no raid and nobody's under investigation meanwhile mm -hmm. quote unquote journalist I, I i use journalist very loosely in this phrase because this person is from the sun knocks on jill's door and says, how do you feel about the fact that your brother is about to be arrested and wants to get a comment from her about it? And she's just like, F off. Yeah. And, she, and again, she's setting boundaries. And she's asking what's going on. And Jim Bob's like, no one's getting arrested. Nothing's happening. There's nothing to this. And then three days later, Josh gets arrested by Homeland Security. So that was a lie. <laughs> Everything's a lie coming from this man. So we get into the the Josh Duggar trial and she does talk about a little bit behind the scenes of her being on the witness list and then she found out last minute she was not going to be called so she could attend the rest of the trial. And this is all stuff that that we've covered and things I think we guessed at pretty accurately that she went for one day and then she decided she didn't need to be there for the verdict and she talks about how it felt to be in the room with so many family members who were sitting there in support of josh or anna and to be there more as a, as an observer and this okay so this is something i wanted to talk about as we're getting close to the end of this book when jill talks about her fears about derek's mother dying when she had cancer she mentions Derek only has one sibling. How is he going to get by without any support in the world? She clearly depends on the support of her family. And can you imagine growing up in a house with 18 siblings, the noise and the chaos, and there's always somebody around. There's always somebody there for you. Can you imagine having that and giving it up? and what the quiet would be like after that especially if you're living in this goldfish bowl situation mm -hmm. where you're on reality television and she describes the alienation in this book that she feels when she's just trying to go out into the world and make friends with people and people either don't want to be friends with her because she's jill duggar and she's from this tv show or people only want to be friends with her because she's from this TV show. And she talks about how much she misses being in El Salvador with the other women 
in El Salvador because they had each other, even though conditions were horrible. I just, I think that's a really important clue as to the validity of Jill's story and her truthfulness when she's speaking about the incredible pain that she's endured. Because people don't just do that for nothing. So Josh gets found guilty and Jill's, her response in this book kind of comes down to, yeah, and he deserves to go to jail for it. He's horrible. The things that he did were horrible. Yeah, she talks about writing the Dillard family statement with Derek. And then she goes to get a lot of therapy. <laughs> there was um, there was a quote from this, like kind of as she's wrapping up her story to this point. And I put this on my Instagram story, so you may have seen it there if you're listening. But um, she says, I have always struggled in that area. I grew up believing subconsciously that whenever there was any bad feeling, it was up to me to do what I could to fix it. And that was mm. that was the one that just had me bawling because that is so relevant to, to my own experience, my own story. You know what I'm wondering? I'm wondering if the NDA that other Duggar family members signed to get that 80K, I'm wondering if the NDA is why Ginger's book sucks so much. You do have to wonder. Like that's legit because I remember everyone was like, ooh, Ginger's got a book coming out. Is anything going to be in it? And she like the only detail what what was the detail that they were freaking out about? The Gothard's girls and putting on a wig in the mall. That's what we were freaking out about. But that wasn't what I saw. Like the um the the headline that I remember seeing was Ginger Duggar says her brother needs a new heart. I'm like, mm -hmm. that's milk toast as f if your brother's a pedophile. But there weren't any like, because like for this one, there were actual bombshells that were coming out of it beforehand, like happens whenever somebody does this style of book. I'm wondering if Ginger took the NDA money and was just like, great, my book can't be about any family stuff. My book is only going to be about why you should join John MacArthur's church now, I guess. I don't like, mm -hmm. ah, man. So she and Derek are in therapy together, just trying to deal with all of this. And I wanted to read one more quote from this therapist, because I thought this was something that maybe a lot of us need to hear. You've been in battle for a long time. You've taken a lot of arrows and there are more coming. Occasionally back in the day when someone would get shot with an arrow, the arrowhead might get lost inside them. And anytime that area got bumped, it would be extremely painful. You've got a lot of different wounds on you. Some are old, some are new, and I don't think many of those wounds have healed right. The room stopped. My breath grew shallow. Cry or run, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I just sat and listened. That's why it hurts so bad so much of the time, Jill. Even when people do the slightest thing, maybe Derek says or does something dumb, but it bumps one of those old arrowheads and triggers all that old pain. And I thought that was such a hopeful description of people who have experienced trauma, a way that we can understand ourselves and maybe other people can understand us a little bit better. So the, what the, the therapist ends up telling her is, you cannot reconcile with your parents right now. <clears throat> like I heard, because this therapist is the one who set them up with the neutral party mediator who did the family therapy session where she and Jim Bob ended up yelling at each other. And this therapist says, I heard how that media mediation session went they're always hard, but that's not normal. You cannot fix your relationship with them until you heal a little bit yourself. Jill kind of takes a break from trying to reconcile with her parents and just works on healing, which is a good lesson for people who have come out of cults or high control religious groups or abusive relationships or whatever it may be. She is, and by the way, she is still in this final chapter of the book praising her parents for things that they did when she was very little. Just wanted to point that out. Oh, it's very clear how much she loves them. And how she writes, I love them, I love them, I love them, I wish this were different, over and over and over again. And she just wants them to really, uh, to, to get their approval and to get their appreciation and their love in the way that she has love for them. And that... I mean, that's that's the through line of this whole book is that Jill really just, she was the good kid and she did everything right. And she is in so much pain now because now 
she's already lost the ability to be their good kid, to be sweet Jill Muff sweet Jilly Muffin, or whatever it was that they called her. And she is grieving that loss, but she still would like to have a relationship with him in the future. So she writes that she reconciled a little bit, had a good moment with Jim Bob when his mother died, and she was able to express just genuine care, just I'm sorry and I love you. And when her third child was born in 2022, her parent, her mother came to the hospital to meet the baby. Jill and Derek had kind of thought about, should we have Jim Bob meet the baby at the hospital? That's a neutral space. It might be a little safer emotionally for us. What do we do? And Michelle rode home with them from the hospital to help with the baby. And Michelle said, oh, well, your dad's coming to pick me up to take me home. Kind of an unspoken question there. And Jill and Derek agreed on the spot to allow Jim Bob into their house to meet his newest grandchild. They extended an olive branch. They took a picture of him with his grandchild. And that's the extent to which they still want to repair the relationship. So, and that was the other time I fully cried reading this book. It was really sad. This was a very emotional read. It was. There's a lot that we skipped over. I definitely recommend actually buying and reading this book much more than I do Ginger's. There is. Don't buy Ginger's. It's not worth the money. If you paid $12 for that book, you could <laughs> get your money back. Like there's a very, very, very small amount of Jesus talk in this book, but it's, it fits the narrative and it is really, really minimal. Uh, it's not preachy. Um, it's more just Jill saying, well, this is where I am right now. I <laughs> look forward to maybe a sequel memoir in 10 years where Jill talks about her full descent into crunchy earth mama <laughs> and how she found weed. You think that's the future for Jill? I think the it's like the reverse crunchy to fundy pipeline. It's going to be the fundy to crunchy pipeline <laughs> for Jill. And she's going to be charging her crystals in the moonlight. And she's going to be, <laughs> she's going to, yeah, she's going to be feeding her children only like oats and barley and uh, moringa nuts and um i would just i would really like to i don't know it's going to be hard if what she really wants is a repaired relationship with her parents it this book is not going to make that any closer to happening but i think maybe she's thinking if i get it all out in the world then i'm done i can focus on myself and maybe they'll come around and want some kind of relationship with me I mean, she did kind of implicate him in tax fraud in this book. Yeah. This is like, I mean, I could understand if she were putting this book out and she's like, maybe I should not implicate my father in a felony in this book that I'm writing. Because you can do, like, if you do tax fraud, they can look back for years. And there's not like a statute of limitations on tax fraud the same way that there is on like rape. That seems wrong. Yeah, it seems wrong. And speaking of which, uh, one more gut punch to end this book, the, the, the lawsuit that Jill and her sisters had against her Arya Stark list of enemies who ruined her life by leaking the, the police report to In Touch Weekly, um, that was completely derailed by Josh's pedophilia trial and a child sex abuse materials trial because they were all just like, well, this is all public now anyway. And also their judge was the same judge that was the judge in that trial. And he kind of just, the impression was that they were all just kind of lumping the, all of the Duggars in together. And if you're on, and there's also sort of like a sense that, well, all your stuff is public anyway, and you're a reality TV family, TV family and you don't deserve privacy. So that kind of sucked to read that documents had, it seems like had been leaked illegally and sent out illegally, but their court case kind of just got dismissed because they're of stuff that their brother did ironically. So that's a, this, this book makes me feel hopeful for Jill. I think we've made it clear that there are um, things that specifically Derek needs to apologize for and Jill needs to, you know, hopefully stop covering for him on that particular matter. And that, but I, I don't know, this, this makes me feel so much more hopeful because as I said at the very beginning, Ginger's whole narrative is, I always knew there had to be a better form of Christianity and thank goodness Jeremy came along to show it to me. 
And Jill's narrative is much more, I was the good girl, I did everything right. And the system still, and my father, just sold me out. Like literally, I did get the impression. Literally. From the way that they, t I did feel like she was almost sold to, to, like maybe she wasn't sold to Derek, but th the fact that she was getting married to Derek Mm -hmm. was a sellable so i did um i did an interview that i can't talk about yet nothing that crazy but i did i talked to a journalist recently we had a whole conversation about this language of buying and selling um when we talk about women and afab people and fundamentalism and how it's you know, i specifically want to be careful not to appropriate that language too far because I don't want to detract from historical sla actual slavery, um, nor s slavery and other similar things that are still happening now. However, in some cases, it is the appropriate language to use. So that's a that's a line that I'm still finding, and I appreciate grace from our listeners on that. Jill's story resonated with me so much because I was so much more like her than how Ginger portrays herself in her book. There were pieces that I could identify with Ginger on, but Jill's seems to be more like me in personality. I really hope, I hope that this is her letting it all out and maybe purging some of that pain from her daily life. I really hope that getting this out makes her daily experiences of this pain less. And I really hope that having her relationship with her mother and father go out in a blaze of glory with the publication of this book, I, I hope that she gets that relationship back. And that is going to require some changes from Jim, Bob, and Michelle. I, this is another thing that comes up in our Facebook group all the time. It's I want to have a relationship with my parents or other relatives or friends who are still in a fundamentalist church or a high control group but I have to set boundaries and they're not taking my boundaries well. And what do I do? And I, I always feel like I say the same thing. It's if you, if you want a relationship, then pursue it. And if you don't, that's okay. It, it's okay. It's, it's your choice. Only, you know, what has gone on between you and people who have potentially been cruel or abusive to you. If you need to walk away, you are, you are correct. You are making the right decision for you. But I also believe that Jill is making the right decision for her in this moment right now when she expresses that she still wants to have a relationship with her parents. And I hope that her burning it all down will give space for something new between them. That was very well put. That's a good place for us to end this episode. Is there anything else that we want to say? That's it for me. That's it for me too. Um, if you like our show we have plenty more episodes about the duggers that are out there we have uh if you want to remind yourself of the details of josh's trial we did a whole lot of trial coverage of the day if you want to remind yourself what a fiasco that was um we also have episodes about the specific beliefs of the iblp and we have lots of episodes about sadie's personal story and her journey out of fundamentalism which I mean, we have like 150 episodes of that. So if you want the content, we got the content. Let me tell you, uh, if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, make you can join our Patreon for an extended version of this episode. You can join our Facebook group for uh, Leaving Eden podcast fans, and that is facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. You can join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Um, you can follow the podcast social media, Facebook and Instagram and threads. It is at Leaving Eden Podcast. Sadie, your socials? Yes, you can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music, on Twitter at Hell Yes yeah, Sadie, and on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at G A V R I E L H A C O H N. Jesus Christ, it is 1 38 in the morning on thursday september 14th i am tired and i am going to bed um I'll edit thank you this. thank you yeah. for your efforts for our podcast thank you for your efforts for our podcast because you have a baby and 
that's more effort than staying up late uh thank you guys so much for tuning in we hope that you guys enjoy it and we hope that you guys will tune in for our other episodes and you guys have a good day bye Yeah.